and pray for the people of those states uh, that their governments did not act in a hasty manner uh, or an evidence-free manner because that creates tremendous danger to people's health and that distinct possibility of the disease reasserting itself. We're not going to let that happen here. That's the bottom line. As I said yesterday, we, we do not expect a perfect linear you know, march to exactly what we want in a way of normalcy. It won't be exactly perfect every day, obviously. There'll be some ups and downs. But what I do believe is that by being transparent, we can ensure that we stay on top of this disease and do not allow that kind of really dangerous big kind of boomerang effect that I think happens if there's a decision to open up before the facts back it up. So each day when I hold a press conference, we go over the indicators, and then every Friday what I'm doing is to talk about the big picture of what the indicators show us over a more expansive period of time, put it all in perspective. Okay, so what, is the, what do the indicators tell us when I look at them in big picture? The first thing they tell us is don't count your chickens before they're hatched. That this virus is tragically still alive and well and living in this city. Uh, that we have not beaten it and we should not take it lightly. It's a fearsome enemy and we need to understand this enemy if we're going to beat it ultimately. Today when I go over the indicators you will see some good things for sure. We've seen that many days. But you have to put it in perspective of what's happening around us. So yesterday, New York City, 2,637 confirmed new cases of the coronavirus in the five boroughs. That is a huge number. The number of people we lost yesterday, 202 New Yorkers lost their lives yesterday to the coronavirus. These numbers when we look at them compared to where we were a few weeks ago, maybe we feel a little better, but we can't forget that each and every one of these cases, each and every one of these numbers is a human being. And we can't for a moment forget what we would have thought about this. If I said these numbers to you three, four months ago, it would have been staggering that that's what happened in a single day in New York City. It would have been staggering. We can't get numb here. We have to realize that numbers like that tell us there's still a real fight ahead, even if we're going to be tugged by that warm weather, even if we want it to be over, and Lord knows we all want it to be over. We got to look at those realities square in the eye. So, everything I'm telling you uh, is context. The biggest reality, I fundamentally believe this, we will win this fight ultimately, is a matter of time. No one knows exactly how much time, but we will win this fight ultimately. But we have to be cognizant, we have to understand our enemy if we're going to win this fight. We cannot forget these realities if we're going to win this fight. So there's a direct correlation between acknowledging these realities, being honest about them, understanding what that calls all of us to do, and then how we ultimately beat this disease back and open our lives up. Anyone who wants to get back to normalcy that toughness you're displaying, that discipline, is the way back. So let's talk about the indicators in the context of a longer period of time. So on indicator number one, daily number of people admitted to hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Well, this chart speaks volumes. It's very striking. And you see it, and you get very hopeful. And you should be hopeful, but you should also be sober about the larger reality at the same time. So this is how many more patients we need to care for each day in our hospitals. Now, when you look at the progress, the peak that we experienced with this disease, we now know back on March 31st, 850 new cases, one day, 850 new admissions to the hospital for suspected COVID-19. On April 11th, when we started putting out these indicators publicly, so basically three weeks ago, went down to 383. That's great. By April 22nd, last Friday, 176. By today, 136. Fantastic. That's the good news. Real progress. However, remember the numbers I told you a moment ago. Overall, 
the number of new positive tests, the number of people who have passed away. And that 136, we feel good about that number, but we still have to remember why we shouldn't feel good about that number, because that's still the number of people every single new day that we're seeing go in to the hospital. So part of what I think is really important to contextualize this is to say, okay, that kind of progress looks incredibly steady, and it is. But at the same time, what would it feel like if we opened up in an atmosphere where there were still hundreds of people each day going into the hospital? It was bad enough they had to go into the hospital and be mid admitted to the hospital for COVID-19. If there were thousands of new positive tests each day, that means every single one of those people potentially could be spreading the disease for losing people every day in, in large numbers. What does it say to us? It says that if you open up too soon, you can pretty much guarantee a resurgence of this disease. That amount of activity immediately tells you that you open the door a little bit for this disease, it comes back strong. That's what we will not allow. Now, we've talked a lot about test and trace, and we're going to keep talking about it. This is going to be the game changer the ability to go after each of these cases and find everyone else who might be affected and test widely, and we're building that up rapidly. But you can see, at the numbers we're talking about now, how daunting a task that is if you're still talking about thousands of new positives each day. It just puts in perspective how much we have to do. Now let's go to indicator number two, the daily number of people in ICUs across our public hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Now, what does this tell us? Well, it tells us a lot of New Yorkers are still fighting for their lives. And it tells us that our public hospitals, which have borne the brunt of this crisis, are still experiencing a lot of strain. And we need to get to the day where there are almost no New Yorkers. One day, we hope, zero New Yorkers fighting for their lives. And we have to get to the day where our public hospitals can rest assured that they can handle whatever is being thrown at them, including all the many, many challenges they deal in normal, with in normal times. So this number is encouraging, again, because there's some decrease. But you'll notice the difference between this chart and the last chart. There's decrease, but nowhere near as sharp a decrease. This causes real pause. You know, when we launched these indicators three weeks ago, our ICUs, our intensive care units in our public hospitals, were basically at double their normal capacity. So it, there's been improvements since then, but, but still not back to normal. And again, listen to the numbers. You, we all like progress, but then you still have to listen to the raw number. April 14th was the day where we saw the most people in these ICUs, 887. By last Friday, it was 786. By today, 704. Steady progress, obviously, but not sharp, sharp progress. And 704 people is a lot of people. So more to do and a particular focus that this, this chart makes you think about the lives of the people right now who are fighting to survive, but it also makes you think about our healthcare heroes who are there every day supporting them and backing them up. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to thank some of the folks who came to the defense of our healthcare heroes. We had leaders of our military here at City Hall and uh, General uh, Terrence O'Shaughnessy. Uh, who has been a key figure in providing help to New York City. He came with some of his other leadership. And we talked about the impact that our military medical personnel have had in our public hospitals, which has been outstanding. I want to thank the Army, the Air Force, the Navy. Deep thanks to uh, General O'Shaughnessy and also uh, to people who I look forward to thanking directly uh, Secretary Esper, General Milley, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They really came to the defense in New York City. Right now, we have almost 700 military medical personnel in our public hospitals. Because remember, this shows you that our public hospitals are still strained, and our healthcare heroes are still fighting a really tough battle, and it's been going on for two months. But 
they got an incredible boost when those extraordinary medical professionals from the military showed up, and they're sticking with it. And we are getting the good news that we expect them to be here during the month of May as well to back up our healthcare heroes. So that's something really, really important. But you look at this and you say, okay, we're really not out of the woods. We gotta save lives. We gotta protect our healthcare heroes. And this chart reminds me if, and it should remind all of us, if you jump too soon, that number starts to go back up, that number goes up too much, then you're back in, into the challenge of trying to expand hospital capacity. You're talking about field hospitals and everything else again. That's a place we do not want to go. You have been listening to New York City Mayor okay, Bill de Blasio give his uh, daily Sorry. news conference on the uh, impact of the coronavirus in his city. We're going to peel well, away from that because we have a lot of news to talk to you about today. But if you're really interested in continuing to watch Bill de Blasio, head over to CBS and New York. They're going to be streaming his uh, press conference live. Um, so you can do that. For now, really good to see everyone. Happy Friday. I'm Anne-Marie Green alongside of Vladimir Dutier. And as per usual, we are coming to you from our home studios. I am in Philadelphia. And Vlad, you're in New York. Yes, it is great to see you, Anne-Marie. And it's great, of course, to be with our viewers again. I'm getting very much used to, uh, you know, for the first couple of weeks when uh, the pandemic really hit here in New York City, um, we were not on the air. We were relying on our affiliates um, across the country, our CBSN affiliates and CBS News uh, O and O stations. But uh, I'm definitely down uh, again with like working this way from you. Even though I said yesterday to my fiance Marion that I do miss like being able to sit next to you and sort of like either pass you notes. <laughs> we don't want anybody else to know what we're saying, or um, just to have a chat. Uh, but it's great to be able to uh, bring the news to our viewers in this way, even if we're doing it from home. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. All right, so let's begin with the news. Uh, here's the new normal right now, Anne-Marie, and what we've been talking about for quite some time. Uh, this lockdown that has occurred across many states is now slowly being lifted. Uh, the White House's federal guidelines on social distancing expire today at midnight, prompting at least 33 states to ease their own restrictions. And according to a survey, conducted by Northeastern, Harvard, and Rutgers University, an overwhelming number of Americans oppose reopening the country's economy immediately. Only 7% of respondents said they would like to see the U.S. resume business activity right now. 7%. Yeah, you know, here's the thing, Vlad, is that in a number of states, in a number of cities, the numbers continue to tick up. Uh, deaths uh, continue to occur in large numbers. In fact, um, in Detroit, the number of coronavirus deaths surpassed 1,000 this week, giving it more deaths per capita than the epicenter, which is New York City. Uh, that did not stop protesters, though, from descending on the state capitol in Lansing, Michigan, demanding an end to the state of emergency that has shuttered most of Michigan's businesses. In a digital town hall, Governor Gretchen Whitmer defended the strict measures and proposed their extension for another month. As to abandon all social distancing, to pretend like we are done with COVID-19 and resume life as it was, that would lead us vulnerable to a second wave. Republican lawmakers in Michigan say that they intend to sue the governor over the state of emergency. Protesters, including heavily armed groups, tried to enter the Michigan House of Representatives chamber yesterday, but were stopped by police. So President Trump says that he has seen evidence that the coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan, China. But he can't share that evidence with us. That's what he said yesterday. The Office of the uh, Director of National Intelligence said that they are investigating this theory. Ben Tracy has been following all of this and is joining us now. Um, so, Ben, you know, the president has um, sort of pointed the finger for the pandemic in a lot of different directions. Uh, now he's sort of pivoting back to China. What else did he say yesterday about this? Well, the president basically blames China and the World Health Organization for not giving out enough information early on about the spread of the coronavirus. But this is different from what the president did say early on. 
he bet, you know, back in January, back in February, he was praising China. He was saying that they're being transparent and that President Xi was doing a good job handling this virus. Uh, and yesterday here at the White House, the president basically intimated that he was praising China because he was trying to get the trade deal done at the time. And now that that is done and he is seeing more evidence that perhaps they withheld information, he is being more critical. What was striking yesterday was that the president said that he has seen credible information that this came out of a lab in Wuhan. He would not say where that information came from because the office of the director of national intelligence has said that they have not concluded that yet. And even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said yesterday, we don't have the answer to that question. So the president seems to have seen something or says he has seen something that the others have not. Yeah, it was sort of striking as well, Ben, to see the president of the United States when he was made aware of uh, the director of national intelligence statement with regards to that demand to know who released the statement uh, to the reporter who asked that question. Uh, uh, what was also striking, Ben, uh, as you know, presumptive Democratic nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, denied a sexual assault allegation against him in an interview this morning. Uh, the president was asked about uh, the former vice president yesterday and a, un, you know, a not typical muted response from the president of the United States. Presumably, Ben, as this uh, uh, race for the White House heats up, if the president is going to go after uh, Vice President Biden for this allegation, he's going to have to do a lot of explaining about the dozens of women who have accused him of similar uh, assault and uh, inappropriate behavior. Yeah, this is not a subject matter that the president particularly enjoys talking about, but we should note that his campaign is very much going after Joe Biden on this topic. But the president, you're right, it was kind of striking. He was asked about this yesterday. He could have unloaded on Joe Biden if he wanted, but he basically said, you know, this allegation may not be true. He said that he, the president, knows a lot about being falsely accused. That's what he said. Uh, we did speak with uh, the counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, just a, a little while ago here at the White House. Uh, she did not uh, share the president's thought on this. She said Joe Biden should release all documents that are uh, at the University of Delaware. She said that all women should be believed and that if the Democrats want to say that when it's somebody accusing a Republican, then they have to be consistent about it. So right now, the president is the only one who is actually uh, kind of saying that this might not be true and we should give, uh, you know, Joe Biden time to, uh, to respond to it. Let me just say, Ben, real quick in memory before we jump, we move on to this. I just want to uh, just say one thing about that, uh, Ben. As you know, uh, the former vice president today on the interview that he gave on MSNBC did say that he was requesting for the United States Senate, which he says is where uh, the complaint, the allegation would have been made um, by Tara Reid. He has called for the Senate uh, to release any and all records with regard to that, although uh, he was pressed on why not allowing the University of Delaware, which apparently has some of his papers there, um, uh, to, to do the same. So just to make sure that people understand that. Yeah, and I think, Vlad, that a little later on in the show, we're going to be sort of digging a little deeper into this one particular story, because it's, it's a big one for today. Um, but I want to ask you about something we talked uh, earlier this week about, Ben. We talked about the vice president, Mike Pence, going to the Mayo Clinic and refusing to wear a mask. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty big deal. It's the policy of the Mayo Clinic to wear masks. Everyone else was. Then he visited a factory yesterday, and he was wearing a mask. We're hearing that the president is going to be heading to Camp David on the weekend. He's also going to be going to, I think, Arizona next week. Do we know if he plans on wearing a mask? Well, yesterday the president was asked about this. He said that he has no problem wearing a mask if the situation calls for it. So if he goes to this Honeywell plant in Arizona and a mask is required, he said he would wear one. He then tends to kind of go on about this and say, you know, if I have to give a speech, I don't know how I'd do that in a mask. And we should note, you know, when they first unveiled these guidelines here at the White House a couple of weeks ago about saying that Americans should be wearing masks when they're out there, the president was the first one who said, I'm not going to do it, and you only have to do this if you want to. So masks are not something that he has been real strongly behind. Um, so we'll have to see. I don't think you're going to see him wearing a mask as he gets on the helicopter here at the White House later today to fly to Camp David. As for the vice president, he did wear a mask yesterday. I'm told that the policy at that plant was made very clear to him. The vice president's office still contends that he was not told that he had to wear a mask at the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic says he was. Hmm. All right. Ben Tracy for us at the White House. Ben, as always, we appreciate your reporting. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, it is International Workers' Day today, and some essential employees are using this as an opportunity to spotlight the unsafe conditions they're working in during the pandemic. Nurses around the country are organizing a protest today. They say they're not receiving sufficient personal protective equipment while trying to save the lives of those diagnosed with COVID-19. Labor union National Nurses United is organizing the demonstration. It says at least 60 nurses have died from the virus. Workers at some major retailers are also uniting, uh, calling attention to what they consider a lack of safety as they work. Employees who are on the front lines working for Amazon, Whole Foods, Instacart, Shipped, uh, Walmart, Target, and FedEx are expected to strike nationwide today. Their demands include providing more pr protective equipment, cleaning supplies, and sick leave during the pandemic. CBS News has reached out to Amazon, Target, Instacart, uh, but they have not reached back to us. We have not heard from them yet. Amazon says that it will be buying PPE for warehouse and Whole Foods employees. Meanwhile, Amazon is now allowing employees who can do their job job from home to stay there through October. You would have think that they would have already done that, but they're doing it now. Indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, the immune system plays a huge part in protecting humans from infections, but there is little information about its role in the coronavirus pandemic, which some experts say could last up to two years. So let's get straight to Dr. Bob Lahita. He is in New Jersey to answer some of our questions, which we are doing on a daily basis now and speaking to some of our medical professionals. So, uh, doctor, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, start by giving us a basic understanding of how immunity works. I think we're going to, for many of us, this is going to be a revisit of our uh, high school biology classes, but explain how it works and why it's so important and tell us how one could become immune to COVID-19. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. When you're infected with anything, there's a, an immune response that is not specific. It's called the innate response. It's sort of like the body's SWAT team. And that attacks whatever the invader is, in this case, COVID-19 virus. About three to five days after the virus makes its appearance, it has on its surface proteins, which distinguish it from other coronaviruses and other viruses like influenza. These proteins set up an adaptive immune response, which means your cells in your body make antibodies to the virus. And this antibody response should be specific and very sensitive. Now, there are all kinds of antibodies in your body, but the key ones that we like to measure are the M and the G antibodies. That tells us whether you've been infected recently or you've been infected a couple of weeks or months ago. And the antibody to the virus is called a neutralizing antibody, which means that it takes the virus and attacks it and neutralizes it. Now, this antibody response can be present for weeks and weeks after you've been infected. And that's what we want to test to see if people have been exposed or indeed infected by this virus. But doctor, it's sort of a little more complicated than that, right? Because um, the coronavirus, there are a number of different antibodies that some of these tests that are out there are, are testing for. And I, I think about, um, you know, the chicken pox, how they always used to tell you when you were a kid, if, once you, if you got the chicken pox once, you never get it, get it again because of, you know, you were exposed to these antibodies. But that doesn't mean you can't get sick again with something similar to the chicken pox. So do we have like an idea of how long you may be immune for if indeed these antibodies indicate that there's some kind of immunity? No, there's no actual timeline because we don't really much know much about COVID-19's responsiveness. But we do know, and you've got to remember that we all get the common cold, and that's a coronavirus for the most part. That's also a couple of other viruses like the rhinovirus, and we've never had a cure for the common cold, right? But we get them over and over again. We try to have neutralizing antibodies to viruses like influenza, but again, we can get that again. So our big concern and the WHO, the World Health Organization's concern is, can we get this viral infection again? And the answer is we simply don't know. We make antibodies, all of our normal immune systems make antibodies to this virus, and we would presume that we can neutralize the virus once it comes into our bodies but we're not so sure that we cannot be reinfected later. 
The tests out of the Far East, like Korea, have shown that what they're measuring antibodies against 20, 30, 40 days out are fragments of the virus. So that scared a lot of people thinking that, gosh, the virus is available to reinfect anybody and you don't have symptoms, but you're shedding the virus. That's probably not the case for now. But we're worried about a resurgence of the virus back in the fall, just like influenza comes and goes, just like the common cold comes and goes. So that's my concern. I would be very happy to know that this virus is dead and that the antibodies have neutralized it. And once you have it, it's not going to come back. And those of us who have had it that are asymptomatic, who have the infections without symptoms, are probably not going to get reinfected again when the fall comes around or the winter of next year comes around. That's what I'm hoping. So, Doctor, just to put a finer point on it, because I'm, I, I think there are a lot of people who, are, who have these questions, and sometimes it makes sense, as Anne-Marie pointed out, uh, to sort of link it to something that people are familiar with. So Anne-Marie mentioned chicken pox. Uh, yeah. Why the chicken pox is caused by the varicella uh, uh, virus. It's also a virus. But why, if we are infected as children, do we then develop an immunity to that particular virus? And what is so difficult about our bodies uh, doing the same when it comes to COVID-19? Well, we don't know about COVID-19, but you're right about the varicella virus. But there are people who have been reported to get chicken pox again, as we all know. So that virus can resurface. But for the most part, that varicella virus, we do become immune to. Um, and there are hopes, and I say hopes because we really don't have any knowledge about this, that once we're infected with COVID-19, that we will be immune for the rest of our lives because of the neutralizing virus. Now, this, uh, because of the neutralizing antibody, I'm sorry, the antibody, we, we presume the IgG antibody uh, is going to protect us, as well as other antibodies that your viewers may not have heard of, like IgA and IgE. We don't know what role those antibodies play with regard to this virus. And then we've forgotten about cellular immunity. We have a whole uh, bevy of cells, like natural killer cells that exist in our bodies that go right after the virus and are far more effective in destroying the virus than the antibodies are. The antibodies is what we can measure. Natural killer cells are very difficult to measure. We've got them, however, and I'm hoping that they're doing their job. So, uh, Doctor, there are all these sort of private companies now that are uh, cranking out these um, antibody tests. Um, I, I think that's you know they're testing for different antibodies, and you, you pointed out that that uh, sort of during the illness there are different antibodies that your that your body is sort of putting out. Um, and there's been talk of something sort of akin to an immunity passport, like if you test for an antibody and it, it turns out that you were exposed to the virus, then you're okay. Um, um, whatever that means. Can we talk a little bit about this concept of an immunity, immunity passport and the dangers that, that lie within that? Well, an immunity passport, I think, is not a good idea. I'll tell you why, because there's cross-reactivity between various coronaviruses. So if you have an IgG against a coronavirus, we're not so sure at this time that that's against COVID-19. It could be a coronavirus of a different type. There are many, many coronaviruses. It's a whole big crowd of viruses that have been existent for many, many uh, centuries and years that we've been exposed to. So an ID card doesn't necessarily mean that you were exposed to COVID-19. And that goes back to something called specificity. Specificity means the virus antibody has to be specific to that virus, the COVID-19. And then there's sensitivity. Sensitivity is a broad term, meaning that the immune system is sensitive to all of the coronaviruses, but why we need this antibody to be specifically directed to COVID-19. And then on your screen, I saw, I saw where you showed herd immunity. Herd immunity is what we want to see, and that means over 70% of the population has been infected and has antibodies. And herd immunity, we, we were seeing with the polio virus, and we were seeing with a whole bunch of other viruses. And this means 
that people will be exposed to the virus asymptomatically and they will have uh, the herd, like a herd of cows or a herd of sheep, that humans will then have global immunity against this infection. And that's the perfect, that's the perfect example of what we want to see going forward, which will protect all of us, put us all back to work and everything will be back to normal again. So there is hope. Looking Looking forward to that. Uh, doctor, before you go, I know you got to run, but in 30 seconds or so, can you just explain why we continue to get flu vaccines every flu season? I get one every season to protect me from the flu. Um, so is that, could we potentially see something similar for the coronavirus or would there be a cure and once you take it, or once you develop antibodies, you're good to go? No, I, I think you're right on target there. Right on target, Vladimir. You, the, the flu vaccine is given to us because the flu virus mutates. And as you know, every year there's a little bit different kind of a virus that can infect us. We know about influenza A and we know about influenza B, but we need to have a boost. Our adaptive immune system has to be shown the virus to provide us with a boost of neutralizing antibody. So for the most part, we're protected when we get our annual flu vaccine. I suspect COVID-19 is going to be the same thing. And we're probably going to package the two vaccines together so that when you get your flu shot in the fall and into the winter, you'll also get your COVID-19 flu shot once the vaccine's available. And that will protect all of us. Most of us realize that even though we have a flu vaccine uh, and we're pretty immune to it, that we can still get some of us can get resurgence of the flu infection. And it's not as severe, but it is protective to us and we will be infected. Now, when I say not as severe, it means that there may have been a subtle mutation in the virus over the year. So that's why we get the virus vaccine every year to protect us against mutations of the influenza virus. We're going to see the same thing with COVID-19, which is already a major concern for us all. All right, doctor, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insight and knowledge. Thank you. So the, uh, the medical conversation is actually going to continue on Face the Nation uh, this weekend. Uh, Margaret Bennett is going to be talking to the CEO of Gilead Science about the antiviral drug remdesivir. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Um, the, uh, they're going to be talking about the effectiveness of treating COVID-19. You want to catch that interview. That's going to be Sunday right here on CBSN at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, I want to apologize to anyone who may have heard my cat howling in the background. She is about to go into her <laughs> own personal quarantine in the other bedroom. Really annoying. Love it. Hey, Love listen. It. Racing fans, yeah, I know. Racing fans uh, may have something to celebrate. Turns out that NASCAR is going to be revving its engines for the new season uh, really soon. So we're going to tell you about when you can expect to see uh, drivers hitting the track, but also, you know, what they're doing to make sure that drivers and fans and anyone else involved in this race um, stay safe. All right, that's after the break. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Thinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. 
Pay eighteen hundred in five days, or you have to leave. Were you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place, and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Hey, we want to give you a, a quick programming note. CBSN is going to be streaming live audio from the Supreme Court's oral arguments via teleconference. That's going to happen next week. You can begin watching that at 10 a.m. Eastern on Monday. Just go to cbsnews.com slash Supreme Court. Meanwhile, the United States Senate is slated to reconvene Monday despite reports that the Capitol's attending physician won't be able to proactively test all 100 senators for the coronavirus. According to the doctor, he only has the resources to test senators with symptoms and that those results will take at least two days. Nearly half of the chamber, we will remind you, is above the age of 65, putting them at a higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and several have known underlying medical conditions. But Senate Majority, Mitch, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says his chamber can work safely as long as members wear masks and practice social distancing. Contrasting that with the Democrat-led House of Representatives, they scrapped their plans to return next week after consulting with the very same doctor. Turning now to Colorado, where a union official is sounding the alarm after a sixth employee has died at the same meat packing plant. And the number of COVID-19 cases more than doubled in just a few days. Here's what you need to know. Confirmed cases among workers at the JBS beef plant jumped from 120 to 245 between Sunday and Wednesday evening. The plant just opened last Friday after an outbreak among workers. The spike in the number of cases comes as the Trump administration moves to keep meat packing facilities open across the country to prevent a mass shortage. Now let's talk about Nebraska, where Tyson Foods is temporarily closing one of the largest beef processing plants in the country. Tyson will suspend operations at the plant from today through Monday to perform a deep cleaning after an outbreak of the coronavirus in the area. The company had disclosed some workers tested positive, but they did not say how many. The facility employs more than 4,000 people who often stand shoulder to shoulder on production lines. J. Crew is preparing to file for bankruptcy protection. The Prepri uh, clothing company is struggling to reduce debt and had been in talks with a group of lenders for several weeks. J. Crew also canceled plans to take its Madewell unit public after the stock market began to spiral because of the coronavirus pandemic. The company had planned to use the money from the IPO to pay down part of its $1.7 billion debt. It could file as early as this weekend. All right. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the NASCAR story, Emery, which I think is, is really fascinating. A lot of people are hoping for this sport to make a comeback. So 
Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. NASCAR plans to return to action on May 17th and become the first major U.S. sport to make a comeback during the COVID-19 outbreak. The race in mid-May will be the first of seven over 11 days, but the drivers will be competing on the track with no fans allowed. There will also be no practice or qualifying rounds, and only licensed NASCAR team members will be allowed into the event. They will have to undergo health screenings and be required to wear face masks when entering and leaving the facilities. All right, coming up, Joe Biden breaks his silence. Hear how he is responding to allegations he sexually assaulted a former staffer in the late 1990s. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here when so many people are out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay $1,800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. For the very first time, Joe Biden has publicly denied sexually assaulting a former Senate aide in 1993. The presumpt presumptive, rather, Democratic uh, nominee uh, made that denial this morning when he spoke about it uh, on television. So Catherine Herridge has been following this story and has a look at his response. No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. Responding to the sexual never assault happened. claim, that he's been under increasing pressure to address, Joe Biden spoke out to MSNBC. Women have a right to be heard, and the, and the press should rigorously investigate claims they make. I always uphold that principle. But in the end, in every case, the truth is what matters. And in this case, the truth is the claims are false. In 1993, Tara Reid worked in then-Senator Joe Biden's office. She says a supervisor asked her to deliver Biden his gym bag, 
and he assaulted her in a Capitol Hill hallway. I remember the coldness of the wall, and I remember his hands underneath my blouse and underneath my skirt, and his fingers penetrating me as he was kissed, trying to kiss me. Reed's allegations have expanded over time. Last year, she told a Northern California newspaper that Biden, quote, used to put his hand on my shoulder and run his finger up my neck. I would just kind of freeze. However, she didn't tell reporters about the alleged assault until this March. Reed, a self-described lifelong Democrat, says she did speak with her supervisors in Senator Biden's office at the time about alleged sexual harassment from the senator and then faced retaliation. It shattered my life and changed the trajectory of my whole career in life. And I lost my job after I complained and I was fired. But two former Biden Senate staffers reclaimed she spoke to told us they had no recollection of any complaint. If there are records, Biden said they would be in the National Archives. I'm asking the Secretary of the Senate today to identify whether any such document exists. If it does, make it public. Reid has spoken to CBS News multiple times in the past month. And on Wednesday, CBS formally requested an on-camera interview. that she told them about the alleged sexual assault back in the 90s. But Reed admits she does not have any record of her complaint and did not file a police report here in Washington, D.C. until last month. Vlad Emery. Catherine, uh, really great reporting there. Uh, so let's talk about the response uh, from the former vice president. Uh, he's deciding to speak out now. Uh, more than a month after the allegation first surfaced, he gave an interview to MSNBC. But the question I have is, uh, it, it strikes me, just following the politics of the moment, that Vice President Biden is going to have to do more than just one interview with what, let's face it, is a friendly network uh, to Democrats um, be, if, he's, if he's going to be able to address these uh, allegations head on. Because at one point, he was asked during the interview if he had anything to, to say to Ms. Reid, and, and he, he said that he didn't want to question her motives, but he was asked specifically about uh, comments that he's made in the past in supporting women mm -hmm. who have made sexual assault allegations. So I don't think you can just do one and be done. Well, I think you're right to talk about the context, Vlad, of the timing, the allegation, and what the former vice president said this morning. So the alleged sexual assault occurred in 1993, according to Tara Reid, but then she didn't make it public until earlier this year. And it seems my assessment, based on the timing, is that vice president, former vice president Joe Biden and his campaign felt that it was gaining momentum and traction and that they needed to address it in an effort to try and silence it or put it to one side as an issue that's been asked and that has also been answered. It's, it's not clear whether this is the end of the story for the former vice president because we haven't had a response from Tara Reid and whether she's able to take her story to a major platform to tell it from her perspective. Now, you mentioned in the story that uh, Joe Biden has called on the National Archives to search for the complaint that Tara Reid says she filed at that time in the 90s. Um, what can you tell us about that and the process and how long something like that might take, if you know? Because I think his denial is not going to be, you know, for some people it may be satisfactory, but for others it mm -hmm. won't be. Well, based on our reporting, Amory, here at CBS News, what we were able to learn is that Tara Reid said that she went through the internal chain in then-Senator Joe Biden's office with complaints to her supervisors, and when she felt that didn't go anywhere, she said, and the language was a little unusual, she said, I went to a temporary or outside office or personnel office. So we don't know exactly what office that was, but Biden said this morning that if there is a physical record of a complaint it would be with the National Archives. He said it would not be with his personal records at the University of Delaware. Those are under seal. And that actually caught the attention of a lot of folks this morning because they wonder whether there's something in those records, aside from Tara Reid's allegations, that could also be interesting, if you will, or the campaign feels they would prefer to have under wraps until after the election. So that's a good question, uh, uh, Catherine, and perhaps you can explain to our viewers those records that are being held by mm -hmm. the Senate. Uh, if the former vice president is calling 
for the Senate secretary to release them to the public. Uh, when could we potentially uh, see those records? Is it up to the vice president to uh, make that uh, request? Um, can reporters make that request, for example? And when you say that the University of Delaware records are under seal, that means that even uh, with a FOIA, a Freedom of Information request, for example, that reporters uh, like yourself, investigative reporters use, um, we would not be able to access those records. Well, I don't want to offer bad uh, information as speculation, but I can tell you about my own experience working through FOIA as well as the National Archives. Uh, the National Archives, you can make a request for records, and as long as they're not classified, uh, they can move fairly quickly. But the critical question is whether the records are immediately accessible. So in other words, they're in an inventory that someone can physically get to, or whether they have to be brought from a storage location and then be searched and then a decision made on how to disseminate them publicly. Of course, in terms of FOIA, if something is under seal, a Freedom of Information Act request really is not going to get you anywhere because under seal means that they are not public until a date certain in the future. Um, so, of course, uh, we are in an election year. President Trump was asked about these uh, allegations against Joe Biden. He brought up what he called uh, false uh, accusations against mm -hmm. Brett Kavanaugh. But I'm curious, has the Trump campaign or other Republicans uh, mm -hmm. reacted or made a commentary on this? Well, Emory, the Trump campaign did issue a statement, and this was in advance of the interview on MSNBC. They said it was uh, not serious, an unscripted reckoning, they likened it to a fan club that was running interference. So the idea that MSNBC would be a very friendly place for the former vice president to respond publicly to these allegations. I listened to the interview, and perhaps I, I missed it, but I would like to have heard more from the former vice president about whether he, he knew Tara Reid, how he knew her, did he hire her, did he know anything about the circumstances of her departure, and then also... What did he make of this anonymous phone call, this call in to Larry King's show alleging this assault had taken place that Tara Reid now says was her mother? I, I would like to have those kind of details, which I, I didn't hear, at least not thoroughly, in the interview this morning. But you raise a good point there, Catherine, uh, because even if those records are released, uh, it does not mean that this assault did not take place, right? I mean, uh, so I think that, you know, for those people who are hoping that if the vice president uh, is able to release these records, um, that, he, you know, again, I, it doesn't mean just because the records are released and there's nothing there that uh, her allegations are not true. The question, of course, becomes uh, in speaking directly to Tara Reid herself, because as you point out, uh, these, these allegations are always difficult to, uh, to assess for credibility. Uh, her story has changed a couple of times. And so we heard from the vice president today, the question becomes, uh, when will we hear perhaps uh, from Tara Reid? Well, I would describe it this way based on our reporting that Tara Reid's story about this alleged assault, sexual assault, has sort of expanded over time. When she first spoke to a Northern California newspaper, she talked about how then Senator Joe Biden made her uncomfortable through alleged physical touching. But then it was earlier this year that it broadened or expanded to this sexual assault allegation in the hallway in the Capitol complex. So I think, as you rightly point out, what matters now is the response from Tara Reid and to what extent people can hear her broadly and make their own decisions as to credibility, the detail of her story, and how she explains some of these gaps or what others would call discrepancies in her account. Uh, Catherine Herridge reporting for us. Catherine, uh, thank you so much. You've done a lot of work this week, including uh, breaking news on the uh, Michael Flynn Department of Justice documents and now reporting this out for us. Uh, thank you very, very I'm much. I'm doing uh, my best here, CBS. I am. Yeah, we'd love to have, we love having you. Thank you. All right, turning now to Georgia, where officials have yet to arrest a suspect two months after the fatal shooting of an unarmed black man. 25-year-old Ahmad Aberi was confronted by two white men while jogging through his neighborhood. The alleged shooter, Gregory McMichael, says he believed Arbery 
looked like the suspect in a string of robberies. McMichael and his son Travis reportedly followed Arbery with a shotgun, forcing him off his jogging path before then allegedly shooting him. Arbery's football coach says he was outraged when he heard about the incident. Somebody chase him down, block off one path, force him to go in the opposite direction, block him off when he goes into the opposite direction, hop out a vehicle with a weapon, and then kill him in the middle of the street. I, when I heard that report, I, I was I, furious, angry. Like, what's going on in my community where we're not protected? What's going on? Like, how is this guy not arrested? Gregory McMichael was a former Glynn County police officer and a former investigator with the district attorney's office. The two prosecutors have already recused themselves due to their relationship with McMichael. The case is now being looked at by a third party prosecutor, Anne-Marie. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move on to New York and talking about uh, inmates who uh, are being released because some are pregnant or have recently given birth. And as the state continues to move its uh, move to stop the spread of the coronavirus across prison systems, the State Department of Corrections says the inmates are within six months of their scheduled releases. So uh, none of them have been convicted of a violent felony or a sex offense, which is why this is happening. An aide to Governor Andrew Cuomo said more releases may be coming. New York has also freed inmates with less than 90 days on their sentence who were 55 and older with nonviolent records. Five nuns have reportedly died of COVID-19 after the virus spread in a Wisconsin uh, convent. According to the New York Times, three nuns at Our Lady of Angels died last month within a week of each other. The church only discovered all five had COVID-19 after they died. The convent, which cares for older sisters with dementia, closed its doors to visitors after four staff members became sick. And according to the report, the facility stopped testing nuns because it found the nasal swabs were too traumatizing for some of the sisters. Wow. Uh, th that's unbelievable. And officials then tell the New York Times that the convent has resumed testing on every resident and sometimes multiple times. Um, all right, as the U.S. continues to grapple with the impact of the ongoing pandemic, we're hearing many Americans say they are not satisfied with the government's response to the crisis. According to a new article in The Atlantic, it's a result of the, quote, serious underlying conditions of a country living in a failed state. George Packer is a staff writer for The Atlantic, and he wrote that piece. He's also the author of Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century, which is a fantastic book, by the way, if I do say so myself. Uh, and he's joining us now to talk about this. Uh, so, George, just give our viewers an understanding uh, of your research. In what ways has the government failed the people as we face this pandemic? Really in the most basic way, which is to give us true information that we need in order to understand what's happening, to give us instructions and guidance about how we should behave, and to organize a response that allows for vital equipment um, and testing to be distributed around the country as it's needed. None of those things have happened. And, you know, in the early days of March, when people were trying to figure out on their own, should I send my kids to school? Should I go into the office? I had an eerie feeling that I was back in the kind of country I used to report in, uh, like Sierra Leone during the Civil War there, or Iraq after the invasion, where no one could count on the government to either tell them what to do or, or give them advice or organize a response or care about them. And in that sense, it did feel as if we were a failed state. I know we don't meet the textbook definition, but in so many ways, our national government has failed to meet this challenge and left its citizens on their own, in some ways competing with each other, depending on what state or region they're in. All those things are the kind of things that should not happen in a great power in a modern state. And they've been happening here since early March. So in your piece, you describe this pandemic as sort of the third major crisis that this country has seen in the 21st century. Uh, the first uh, crisis being 9-11, the second one being the recession, one uh, uniting us as a country, the other one tearing us apart. Can you describe how the two previous crises 
uh, had an impact on the response to the coronavirus? I think on 9-11, I was in New York that day, the overwhelming feeling among Americans was to come together, to show solidarity, to see New York as a symbol of the country that had taken a hit for the whole country. As we all remember, we who were adults back then, that unity began to disintegrate pretty quickly, especially with the Iraq war and the forever wars of the global war on terrorism. The 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession, I think, accelerated the disunity, the polarization. It began to divide us by class, by race, by political partisanship. Um, and it also divided ordinary people from the institutions that we need in order to function. The distrust grew, the sense that elites were getting away with something that the rest of the country was suffering from. So by the time the coronavirus hit, I think our immune system was down um, and our, uh, our ability to respond as a country, a united country, was, was weakened. And I think those earlier crises turned out to have done a lot of damage to our ability to come together as a country when uh, something is, uh, as dire, you know, this kind of pressure was applied to us. It turned out the system wasn't going to work very well. You, you know, I, I'm sure I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm just like a lot of, of my fellow Americans who when they saw uh, those long lines of people waiting uh, to uh, receive food at food banks um, and who've seen the shortage, of PPE, uh, who have seen uh, people turned away um, from testing, uh, that a lot of people sort of think to themselves, how is this happening in what the, the mythology around the United States, which is you know the, the richest, the most powerful, um, the, you know the everything, the end all be all of, of republics. And your piece sort of digs into criticism of President Trump for how he has led the country, particularly during this pandemic. But I guess my question becomes, how much of the issues we are seeing now can we attribute to his presidency rather than it being a result of a long, broken system? This didn't happen overnight. Uh, this is perhaps something that first started back in the 1960s or in, in the early 70s, perhaps, um, with, with the way our politics changed with the election of LBJ or perhaps Richard Nixon. And I, I wonder how much of, of the past is now being uh, felt uh, now today in 2020 of things that have sort of systematically been uh, sort of being whittled away over the course of the last 20 or 30 or 40 years. I think you're right to look back in history and to go back 40 years or so. The other thing that began in the 70s was economic inequality began to widen and has been widening ever since. And we've seen the results of that every day in the way poor people, black people, brown people have suffered from this crisis. People in uh, working class jobs, which we now call essential work, and, it, and, and others have not felt it in the same way. Um, so it's right to look back. But I see the Trump presidency itself as a symptom of that deterioration. The fact that we elected this man, who was so obviously unfit during the campaign, showed that, the, that polarization and a sense of, of hostility to authority and to elites and to government itself, the sense that maybe government didn't matter that much. And we might as well put uh, a reality TV star in charge of it because maybe he could do a better job than the professional politicians. That in itself was a sort of nihilistic impulse that we're now seeing the result of. For three years, we didn't feel it intimately, directly in our lives because there was no crisis. But we should have known that as soon as a crisis like this came, Trump would be incapable and really unwilling to meet it because he doesn't believe that uh, government ha is answerable to its citizens. He, in a sense, he thinks that the government is answerable to him and him alone. Um, he's governed that way. He's acted that way. He has uh, hollowed out the civil service so that now when we need it, uh, it turns out a lot of experts are missing, and, and those who are still there are under the thumb of an utterly politicized um, White House. So, yes, all this has been a long time coming. Under Trump, it became inevitable. I think other presidents would have been challenged to deal with this in a, in a competent way, but with Trump, it was a foregone conclusion that the result would be disastrous.
So then, George, the question is, where do we go from here, right? A lot of people have said to me that they felt like this experience was going to result in a shift, that there would be sort of a new normal after the dust has settled. Um, how do, what will it take to fix this broken system? Could this crisis be the catalyst, or is it going to take another crisis? I think this one has to be the catalyst, because we don't get that many crises <laughs> to fix it. Um, I can only say I hope so. I hope that the lesson Americans take from this is that we need a competent, functioning national government, that we need experts to be able to tell us the truth without a, pol a political smokescreen, um, that we need an economy that doesn't regard those workers we now call essential as disposable, with that we don't force for example, meat packers to go back onto the job when the meat packing plants are riddled with coronavirus, and that workers have basic protections, that they have paid sick leave and health insurance that now we see is essential but isn't there for so many of them, that we have an unemployment insurance system that works uh, so that people can immediately get the help they need. We've allowed all of that to be neglected, to deteriorate, and I hope that this is enough. And I think a lot of Americans are waking up to the fact that so many of our vital institutions have been weakened and we cannot afford to let that continue. George Packer, thank you so much. Um, if you want to hear more of what he has to say on this topic, you should check out his piece in The Atlantic. And of course, as Vlad pointed out, you are also the author of Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century. Uh, high, high reviews from uh, Vlad and others. Um, thank you so much, George. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin has tested positive for COVID-19. Mishustin is the first senior official in Russia to contract the illness. He has placed himself in isolation until further notice. Mishustin is one of the key leaders in Russia's battle against COVID-19. There have been over 100,000 confirmed cases reported in the country and more than 1,000 deaths. And meanwhile, leaders around the world are frantically looking for ways to stop the spread of the coronavirus. But UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez says that won't happen until those leaders work together. Gutierrez spoke with our partners at the BBC about the lack of global leadership during this pandemic. You have described COVID-19 as the biggest challenge facing the world since the Second World War. Have you been surprised and shocked by the immense scale of death and the immense scale of economic disruption? Shocked? Obviously, yes. I mean, it's uh, dramatic to see so many people dying, and it's dramatic to see this devastating I impact on economies and societies, especially on the most vulnerable people. But not surprised, because unfortunately, uh, what is true is that the world was not able to come together and to face COVID-19 in a articulated, coordinated way. Each country went with its own policy, uh, different countries with different uh, perspectives, uh, different strategies, and this has allowed the virus to spread. Who do you blame for that? Are you talking about the great power rivalry between the United States and China, this propaganda war that has erupted since COVID-19 became a pandemic? I think it's obvious that we lack a, a, a leadership uh, that can only be possible if the key countries in the world, the key powers in the world, are able to come together. And when you say about the lack of global leadership, are you talking about Washington? Are you talking about President Trump? Are you talking about Beijing? I think that there is a, a dysfunctionality in today's world. I think leadership and power are not associated. There are examples of leadership. Uh, there are, of course, powers. What we have not yet been able was to combine uh, in the world power and leadership uh, in a way that could move the whole of the international community to solve uh, our dramatic problems and to do it effectively. There have been criticisms of the World Health Organization for failing to sound the alarm early enough. Have you been satisfied with the performance of the WHO? It's a remarkable organization uh, and an organization that, in my opinion, is absolutely crucial at the present moment and needs to be supported. Now, it is also true that uh, uh, when uh, all this ends, in my opinion, we need to look seriously uh, as international community in how this uh, uh, pandemic emerged, 
how it spread so quickly, and how the different actors that were involved uh, behaved uh, in order to learn uh, our lessons and to be able in the future not to have the same mistakes. Do you think the Trump administration was wrong to suspend its funding of the WHO? I believe that it's essential to keep as maximum as possible uh, resources within WHO because in the present situation, and for the reasons I invoked, it's impossible to replace it in providing support, especially to the developing countries. And today, my main concern is in the developing world. There's a saying in government, you should never waste a crisis. And what you're saying is that the world should regard this as a wake-up call uh, for another global emergency, which is climate change. Undoubtedly. And I think we have an opportunity now to do things differently. And I think we have the obligation now to organise the recovery in a way that is much more friendly to the green economy and the green society. Not to spend the money for the recovery in uh, supporting fossil fuels or in bailing out uh, the most uh, polluting industries, uh, doing everything possible to create green jobs, doing everything possible to uh, ensure that when we recover the economy, we built a more sustainable and inclusive one. If there is one global lesson that we can take from this crisis, what is it? The fragility of today's world. We are very fragile and we need to overcome it by working together. Secretary General, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Coming up, misinformation about the coronavirus spreads like wildfire online. Axios Media reporter Sarah Fisher explains what authoritative figures can do to help separate fact from fiction. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here when so many people are out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay $1,800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS.
Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Making sense of our world. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Coronavirus misinformation can seemingly spread like wildfire online, but new research finds there are ways to combat inaccurate information. Sarah Fisher is an Axios media reporter, and she joins us now from her home to talk about this. So, Sarah, explain what researchers have discovered and walk us through what we've seen uh, the suggested action in practice should look like. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. So essentially, we all thought after the 2016 election, when there was a lot of misinformation at that time, that we should label things as being true or false, and that would help the problem. But what researchers have found over the past four years is that actually can make it worse. When you use binary labels like true or false, you might incentivize people to click something labeled false just because they're curious to see what it is. It also politicizes the problem. Oftentimes when you're going out and labeling something true or false, because of the hyper-political environment, people take issue with it, they feel offended, you're calling my perspective wrong. So what researchers and academics say is better to do is actually just to provide a lot of supplementary information that's factual alongside the misinformation, allow people to get a little bit more context, and that way they can get exposure to the truth without you negating something and calling it false that might offend someone or incentivize them to click it further. Um, Sarah, I found your article so interesting um, because it sort of makes, explains this in a very, very scientific way based on the people who just focus on misinformation and how to combat it. I thought the point about um, misinformation reaching sort of 10% penetration into a population that you almost sort of, before you, before you decide to combat it, it needs to kind of be exposed to a certain amount of people, but not too many people in order to have um, an impact. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will say, look, this is about freedom of speech. It's about a conversation. You, you know, we the government doesn't always tell us everything, so we should be allowed to kind of research. Um, can we talk about how damaging incorrect information can be and why the WHO is so concerned? Absolutely. And you make a great point about the 10% theory, which is essentially don't waste your resources debunking something unless it's hit a threshold where it's actually a problem. And part of that research also said, don't focus on misinformation that's not really dangerous. I mean, there are a lot of rumors out there. How did the disease spread? But that's not what's actually dangerous right now. What's dangerous is misinformation about cures that could actually make it much worse and be even worse for your health. So it's prioritizing what to go after is a huge issue here. Uh, in terms of why misinformation is so damaging, we call what we're in right now an infodemic. You see that graphic on the screen. An infodemic is when you have so much misinformation that it's actually making the problem a lot worse. What we found with COVID is that there was so much, mis much misinformation about how you prepare for it that it made the problem worse. We were going out and saying, this is spreading like wildfire. And so in the beginning of the epidemic, people were buying up masks and gloves and personal protection equipment that we really needed to go to the healthcare workers, which was making the problem even worse. And so I think the big solution, the big takeaway from this article is you need authoritative people, government officials, healthcare officials, to be giving people context, to be using scientific tools to combat misinformation as opposed to just labeling something false. You know, as I read your piece, Sarah, and you know, we've talked, uh, we've talked often on the air and off the air about this stuff. Uh, you know, just sort of my caveman question, my caveman theory about all this is, you know, does a lot of it have to do with how we receive information in 2020? And I know it sounds simplistic, but the fact that you know, 
there have been multiple articles and even perhaps books that have been written about the fact that whilst we have the entire world at our fingertips, either through our computers or through our devices because of the internet, you would think that that would make people smarter. You would think that that would provide people more information that is credible and transparent. But in fact, the reverse and the opposite has been true. As these, uh, as the internet has become all encompassing in our lives, we've actually become, for lack of a better word, less smart because we are unable to vet so much of the information that is coming to us. And I know it sounds kind of um, simplistic to say, you know, perhaps people should still make sure that they have a good set of encyclopedias at home. Um, but, but really, it, it has to do with the way that we, we receive information. So short of, you know, completely deconnecting from the internet, what can, what can people do to ensure that they are not getting uh, misinformation that is suspect or biased? Such a good question. Well, the first part of this is that healthcare officials need to be pre-bunking or exposing people to correct information long before we have a problem in order to prepare people for when we do have a problem. So an example of that is when this pandemic first broke out, health officials told everyone, you need to wash your hands. Notice, Vlad and Emery, there wasn't a lot of misinformation about whether washing your hands actually works. And the reason is, We've educated our population for decades that hand washing helps cure the common cold. But what we did have a lot of misinformation around was vitamin C. We have done a bad job as a society of educating people about the fact that vitamin C does not cure a cold. It can boost your immune system, but it's not a cure. And so we saw at the beginning of this outbreak, there was so much misinformation about go buy vitamin C. When in reality, that wasn't something that we needed to do. So first and foremost, health officials need to pre-educate people. Secondly, if you're a person who needs to figure out where am I getting my information? Is this misinformation? Is it not? The thing I would always say is go to credible sources where people use editors to vet information. A credible source may not be social media. Those are not news companies. Try to get your information from vetted news companies, you know, big broadcast networks, of course, but then also newspapers. Your local newspaper is a great resource as well. And just to add sort of one more thing, though, you know, the research that you talk about has a lot to do with, you know, credible sources and authority figures. But we have an issue here in which we have an authority figure, the president of the United States, who has delivered incorrect or un, um, unverified information. And doesn't that kind of throw a monkey wrench in everything? Yes, and this is why it's such an important role that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Dr. Deborah Birx are playing right now, is that we do have a president who's been spewing misinformation, and so they are trying to kind of almost like clean up and you notice they're going everywhere. I mean, I was really impressed that Dr. Fauci was on the virtual NFL draft spreading proactively correct information about social distancing and the virus. What they're trying to do is they're just trying to be everywhere so that if authoritative figures like the president were to spew misinformation, they can go out and discount it. And also notice part of the research we did is you need as an authoritative health figure to go to venues where people are exposed routinely to misinformation. So if you're Dr. Anthony Fauci, going on a network like CBS, where there doesn't tend to be a lot of misinformation, that actually doesn't help you so much. That audience is not predisposed and exposed to misinformation. What they recommend someone like Dr. Fauci do is go to places like opinion shows on Fox News, where there is misinformation being spewed, speak to that audience and try to educate them there because they're the ones that were exposed to misinformation in the first place. Really, really great information, great reporting. Uh, Sarah Fisher uh, from Axios, as always, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, you too. All right. Whole Foods says it will start providing customers with face masks inside its stores. The supermarket chain says the disposable masks will be available within the next week. All customers without their own masks will be provided with one at the entrance. Amazon, which owns Whole Foods, says it, invests, it expects to invest around $800 million by July in COVID-19 safety measures like masks, gloves, and thermal cameras. It has been 75 years since Nazi Germany surrendered and World War II 
ended in Europe. But coronavirus concerns has canceled the annual Victory in Europe Day celebration. Simon Bates has some words on that in this week's London Calling. This is what I see out of my window every morning. A month ago, I locked up my London apartment and moved full time to my farm here in England's beautiful southwest. I feel safer here. Even so, I do miss the excitement of spending some of my week in the heart of one of the world's greatest cities. But I won't be missing a massive party that our capital was planning for next Friday because it's been cancelled. As British troops met their Russian comrades shortly before the complete collapse of the German armies. 75 years ago, British and Russian forces met on German soil and the Second World War in Europe officially ended. It was announced by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. No more of these disturbing pictures of the Nazi leader Adolf Hitler surveying his latest conquest. He'd killed himself eight days earlier. The Germans collapsed and surrendered, and later that day in London, huge crowds gathered to celebrate victory in Europe, VE Day. Britain's King George VI spoke to the world. But today, we give thanks to God for a great deliverance. A Germany, the enemy who drove all Europe into war, has been finally overcome. Then the King and Queen shared the moment with Churchill, with the familiar face on the left of the balcony. See it? Our current Queen Elizabeth, who later slipped away to join the crowds. It was a day to savour for both our nations. Now, next Friday's party was to celebrate the 75th anniversary of this tremendous victory. Our government had already declared it a public holiday with a fly past of wartime planes and a procession towards Buckingham Palace. But then came the virus, and most of the events were pulled. After all, nobody wanted to endanger the lives of the remaining veterans. The Queen will still broadcast to the world with her personal memories of that historic day, and there will be thousands of local events in towns and villages across Britain, often centred around the local war memorial. This is ours, not far from the farm. And a few miles away, I came across this, a memorial to the 4th Infantry Division of the US Army, which was headquartered here in Devon prior to the D-Day landings, a little piece of America tucked away in the English countryside. And so next week's VE Day celebrations will be largely invisible, just like the deadly enemy our countries are fighting today. That's London Calling. This is Simon Bates for CBS News in Devon. I love Simon Bates and these reports, uh, London Calling. Uh, thank you, Simon, very much for that. All right, now to this. A 72-year-old man from England is now officially the oldest person to row across the Atlantic Ocean solo. Graham Walters will also earn a Guinness World Record for being the oldest person to row across an ocean more than once. Walters almost missed the record at the end of his trip in Antigua when the Coast Guard had to tow him due to strong winds. He started the journey back in January before the coronavirus outbreak became a pandemic. Now he's adjusting to a new life because of lockdown restrictions. I love people like that. Uh, first of all, I probably would, would never do anything like that, but I certainly wouldn't do it twice. If I did it <laughs> once, I would just rest on my laurels. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. You'd be like, ah, it's too much trouble. <laughs> yeah, I'm Needs good. It. I'm good. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, Vlad, we've made, uh, we've talked a lot about sort of the uh, economic implications of this coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, one of the areas that are hit, that ha have been quite, been hit quite hard are the arts. Because, you know, let's face it, it's not about survival, it's not about food, clothing, and shelter. So art kind of becomes sidelined. And the Association of uh, Art Museum Directors has temporarily changed its guidelines. 
as institutions really, um, you know, suffer and buckle under the weight of the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So according to the Washington Post, the association is now allowing museums to sell their art to support direct care of their collections. Officials previously disapproved of museums selling art to raise money. The new guidelines also allows them to use money from endowment funds, trusts, or donations to cover general operations rating expenses. Um, these are sort of the little things that we don't think about. And um, as, as we all know, art makes a huge difference in our lives, particularly when we are dealing with trying times. Um, we, uh, we talked a little bit about the Getty Museum, how they kind of put out a little bit of a challenge for people to dress up like famous paintings and take pictures. And even though art may seem frivolous when you're just talking about survival, it's a very important thing to maintain. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right, Anne-Marie. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's debatable whether or not uh, art and uh, things like it, whether it's literature or film or, or music, is not essential to the soul, as essential as, you know, uh, things that physically keep us well. Uh, the things that keep us mentally and yeah. soulfully well are in, uh, very, very important, I, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I hope that once this pandemic is finally contained, um, that, you know, all of us will flock back to those institutions that we love, like libraries, like uh, art uh, galleries and uh, museums. Um, and, you know, in, in some places like in New York City, uh, oftentimes you just have to give a donation. There's actually no fee to enter some of the, uh, the museums here, which are wonderful world-class museums, um, you know, that perhaps we will all change if we, if we can, if we can spare the extra money, understanding that millions of people are out of work, uh, to donate a little bit more um, of our dollars to those institutions that keep us uh, soulfully fit as well. Yeah, indeed. All right, so we have a lot more coming up. We're going to hear from the uh, WHO as it responds to uh, the way it has been dealing with the pandemic. Also, later on, we're going to hear from New York Governor uh, Cuomo again. You know, he does these daily briefings. Uh, people all over the country tune in, whether they live in New York or not. So we'll be bringing that to you as well. It is remarkable that uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo has sort of uh, achieved the national stature uh, over all this. So yeah, as you point out, Emory, we're gonna have that. And let me remind you, if you have not already, to download the free CBS News app on all of your devices. You can watch CBSN anytime, anywhere, on any connected device. The app is free and so is our website. What a great deal. That website is cbsnews.com. We'll be right back. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Sinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. 
The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. In times of uncertainty... Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers... Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease, or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. A young girl's mysterious disappearance remained one family's dark secret for more than 20 years. Once investigators became involved, it would take almost another two decades to close the case. In 1981, 13-year-old Mary Day vanished from her home in Seaside, California, and her parents said that she ran away. Her sisters suspected she was killed. Ori Maher has that story. In 2002, Seaside, California police captain Steve Sircone had a baffling case on his hands. What happened to 13-year-old Mary Day? Mary Louise Day was a, a girl that lived in Seaside. In about 1981, she disappeared. What do you mean she disappeared? She disappeared off the face of the earth. There is no record that her mother Charlotte Hool or stepfather William ever reported her missing. It's hard to believe allowing a child to walk away or a child go missing and it's not reported. I can't remember a time when a child was not reported by the parents. Younger sister Sherry Calgaro, who was 10 when Mary vanished, turned to middle sister Kathy for answers. Laying in bed one night with Kathy, I asked her, what happened with Mary, you know? And she was like, shh, don't say anything. We're not allowed to talk about Mary. When Sherry grew up, she filed a missing persons report. By the time Seaside Police launched its investigation, there was little to go on. It was a very hard case to deal with. Other than the family, nobody knew she was gone. Mary's mother told detectives that her daughter ran away, as she had so many times before. Tracing Mary's last known whereabouts, lead detective Joe Bertina took Kathy back to her childhood home. She told Bertina that she saw their stepfather, William, beat Mary. Last time I saw her, she had the blood coming out of her mouth. Detectives began to believe that William had murdered Mary. William told me that uh, he didn't kill Mary Day, but his wife told him that he was possessed that night and that he had a demon inside of him. A team of cadaver dogs were brought to the home to search for human remains. As the dogs went into the backyard, they each hit on one particular spot near a tree. We started to dig. And as we dug, I saw a little girl's shoe. But there was no body. Still, the investigators were confident in their homicide case. Until a year later, when it took an unexpected turn. When I got a phone call, he told me, uh, hey, uh, Captain, he says, you sitting down? He said, got to let you know that they say that they, uh, they found Mary Day. All right, so Maureen Maher is joining us now. Oh, what a twist at the end there, uh, Maureen. I, I guess the image of the woman is she sort of could look like Mary Day, but so many years have, have passed. Uh, do we know who she was? I mean, was she Mary Day? Well, that is the mystery. I mean, we there are DNA tests that are performed. The cops are very suspicious. The family is skeptical. And adding to the skepticism, Anne-Marie, it's that just three weeks before she is found by the police in this random uh, uh, stop of a uh, pickup truck, she had a state ID issued that she'd never had before. I mean, this woman was off the grid from the time this 13-year-old disappeared. If it's in fact Mary Day, there's literally no electronic record of her, no social security, no pay stubs, no nothing. 
So just to clarify, Maureen, how soon after Mary's disappearance does this woman claiming to be her show up? Oh, it's decades, Vlad. It's, it's years and years after she... So, you know, do any of us, if you look at our, our childhood pictures, there's some resemblance for some of us. Other people look exactly like they did when they were a kid. But you have to figure, if it's her and she vanishes one night after she has allegedly been beaten by her stepfather, she has lived a very hard life. And that's what happens when I go to speak to this woman. After five years of us looking for her, I finally get a chance to meet her. And I have to tell you, like, it was clear from the moment I met her that this is someone who had a hard life. Whether she's Mary Day or not, it was not an easy life. And you change in appearance if you've lived that hard of a life. Well, so she was actually willing to sit down with you and talk about this. Yeah, so she spoke with us. Um, we go back and we find her in Missouri. And the sister that you met there, Sherry, the woman who starts it all by filing that missing persons report, she is still not sure. So we all go down together to speak with this woman who we all come to call Phoenix Mary because it was the Mary who was found in Phoenix. And the cops really make the distinction between Mary who vanished and Phoenix Mary. And you'll find at the end of the show whether or not Phoenix Mary was able to convince Sherry. But there's a twist, and I'll tell you that even five years into covering this case, we didn't see the ending coming the way it, it finally ended up. Wow. Wow. Uh, what an interesting tease, an interesting twist. Uh, Maureen, thank you very, very much. Really, really looking forward uh, to this uh, weekend's 48 Hours. Good to see you both. Thank you. And you can watch tomorrow's episode, Whatever Happened to Mary Day? That will be at 10 p.m. Eastern on CBS. And of course, you can also stream it on demand on CBS All Access. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay $1,800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. 
times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Millions of Americans woke up to a new normal today as some states start to scale back their lockdown orders. The White House's federal guidelines on social distancing expired today, prompting at least 33 states to ease their own restrictions in some way or another. And according to a survey conducted by Northeastern, Harvard, and Rutgers universities, an overwhelming number of Americans oppose reopening the country's economy immediately. Only 7% of respondents said they would like to see the U.S. resume business activity right now. In Detroit, the number of coronavirus deaths has surpassed 1,000, giving it more deaths per capita than the epicenter, which is New York City. Uh, that did not stop protesters, though, from descending on the state capitol in Lansing, Michigan demanding an end to the state of emergency that has shuttered most of Michigan businesses. In a digital town hall, Governor Gretchen Whitmer defended the strict measures and proposed their extension for another month. The worst thing we could do is to abandon all social distancing, to pretend like we are done with COVID-19 and resume life as it was. That would lead us vulnerable to a second wave. While Michigan's state of emergency is in line with the federal health advice, protesters still say that they object to Whitmer's reasoning behind the shutdown. I can under understand uh, the, uh, the, the, what, what she feels is the need for this, uh, but I, think, uh, I don't think it's really backed up with, uh, with science and, and statistics uh, for, for the necessity of, uh, of a complete shutdown. Republican lawmakers in Michigan say they intend to sue the governor over the state of emergency. Protesters, including heavily armed groups, tried to enter the Michigan House of Representative chamber yesterday, but were stopped by police. So President Trump says that he has actually seen evidence that proves the coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan, China, but he cannot make that evidence public. Uh, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence said that they are investigating that theory. So earlier today, we spoke to Ben Tracy about that and some of the other things that the president had to say about the coronavirus. Well, the president basically blames China and the World Health Organization for not giving out enough information early on about the spread of the coronavirus. But this is different from what the president did say early on. He, you know, back in January, back in February, he was praising China. He was saying that they're being transparent and that President Xi was doing a good job handling this virus. Uh, and yesterday here at the White House, the president basically intimated that he was praising China because he was trying to get the trade deal done at the time. And now that that is done and he is seeing more evidence that perhaps they withheld information, he is being more critical. What was striking yesterday was that the president said that he has seen credible information that this came out of a lab in Wuhan. He would not say where that information came from because the office of the director of national intelligence has said that they have not concluded that yet. And even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said yesterday, we don't have the answer to that question. So the president seems to have seen something or says he has seen something that the others have not. Yeah, it was sort of striking as well, Ben, to see the president of the United States when he was made aware of uh, the director of national All right, let's take you now. Uh, we're sorry to interrupt Ben Tracy, but uh, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is delivering his daily briefing on the pandemic here in New York State. So let's go and listen to that. You tell me what we do today, I will tell you the number of people sick tomorrow. So every day we get up, every day everyone says, oh my gosh, I have to do this again. Yes, but what you do today is going to determine the number of sick tomorrow. And New Yorkers 
have continued to do what they have to do, and you see that number of hospitalizations uh, dropping. And that is all good news. And that is a credit to the community and the social conscience and the responsibility of New Yorkers. The question now is, as we're on the decline, how fast is the decline and how far is the decline? How low will the number actually wind up? Right now, we're at about 1,000 new cases per day, okay, in the 900s, 954, 933, 970, 973. That's four days. The day before that, it was 1,076. That uh, looks like the number is flattening, is plateauing at about 900, 1,000 cases. Three, four days, five days, if you want to say, between 900 and 1,100. That is still too high a number of new cases to have every day. It's not where we were. It's a lot better than where we were, for sure. But 1,000 new cases every day is still a very high infection rate. It's still a burden on the hospital system. So we now want to take it to the next level. Let's drill down on those 1,000 new cases. Where are they coming from? Why is the infection rate continuing? Who's getting infected? And let's get more targeted in our response, right? We're fighting this statewide, but you have to wage the battle, wage the war on many fronts. It's a statewide battle. Uh, now that we have it basically stabilized and on the decline, the enemy is on the run, the virus is, is reducing, let's get more refined, more targeted. And I'm going to be speaking with the hospitals this afternoon and say that we want to get more specific information on those new cases that are coming in the door. Where are they coming from? Who are they? Uh, to see if we can come up with a more specific target. If you look at the past few days where the cases have been coming from, this is a three-day, what they call rolling average. Uh, but you see, 17% from Manhattan. Much of it correlates to population, but much of it also correlates with uh, downstate New York. 17% Manhattan, 17% Kings, 12% Bronx, 11% Queens, but then 10% Nassau, 7% Westchester, Suffolk. So it's a downstate region, and then upstate, it's uh, Erie County. So gives you a snapshot of where the cases are coming from, but we need more specific information to have a specific battle plan. Uh, literally, where do the new cases come from? Are they essential workers? Are they people who are staying home and getting infected by a family member? Or are they essential workers who are still traveling and uh, possibly getting infected at work? Uh, where do they work? How do they commute? Is this a question of getting infected on public transportation? We just announced new subway buses, Long Island Railroad, Metro North. Uh, protocols, uh, where in the state are these people who are being transferred from a nursing home, what's their sex, what's their age, what's their previous health status, what are the demographics. Let's get more specific information from the hospitals to see if we can come up with a strategy that is more tailored to the reduction of uh, these 1,000 cases per day. The number of deaths, 289 lower than it has been, uh, but still uh, tragic and terrible. And uh, all the good numbers, all the good news uh, for me every day, this number just wipes that uh, all away. Uh, we announced a statewide policy for our schools. We did it uh, last March 18th. We said that we were going to close schools all across the state uh, K to 12, 
and uh, higher education schools. We waived what was called the 180 day requirement, which was the state regulation that schools had to have 180 days of teaching. Uh, schools then transferred to distance learning programs, meal delivery services, child care options for essential workers. That has actually worked out well, not perfectly. We had to do it in a rush, but there are lessons that we can learn here uh, that could change teaching going forward and, and teaching in these types of situations going forward. But it did work. Uh, uh, it basically functioned well. And teachers did a ph phenomenal job stepping up to do this. It was a hardship on everyone, but uh, we made the best of the situation. Colleges and universities were also moved to distance learning. Campuses were closed unless a student really needed housing on the campus. Uh, schools, obviously, by definition, have higher density. They have transportation issues, kids who are getting on a bus. Uh, we didn't have the protective measures to put in place. You have 700 public school districts, 4,800 schools in this state. Then you have 1,800 private schools, uh, 89 SUNY and CUNY campuses, 100 private colleges, and total is 4.2 million students. So the decisions on the education system are obviously uh, critically important. We must protect our children. Every parent, every citizen feels that. Uh, we must protect our students. We have to protect our educators. And given the circumstances that we're in and the precautions that would have to be put in place to come up uh, with a plan to reopen schools with all those new protocols, how do you operate a school that's socially distanced, with masks, without gatherings, with a public transportation system that has a lower number of students on it? Uh, how would you get that plan up and running? Uh, we don't think it's possible to do that in a way that would keep our children and students and educators safe. So we're going to have the schools remain closed for the rest of the year. We're going to continue the distance learning programs. Schools have asked about summer school uh, and whether we'll have attendance in schools for summer school. That decision will be made by the end of this month. Uh, again, nobody can predict what the situation is going to be three, four weeks from now. So we're trying to stage decisions at intervals that give us the information, but also enough time for people to make the preparations they need to make. So any decisions on summer schools will be made by the end of this month. Uh, but in the meantime, meal programs will continue. The child care services for essential workers will continue. And then we want schools to start now developing a plan to reopen. Uh, and the plan has to have protocols in place that incorporate everything that we are now doing in society and everything that we learned. We're going to be asking businesses to come up with plans that safeguard workers when they reopen. We need schools to come up with plans also that bring those precautions uh, into the schoolroom. And that's for schools, that's also for colleges, uh, and the state will approve those plans. Related issue that we need to discuss and we need to pay attention to, this COVID crisis has caused significant disruption and many uh, unintended consequences and ancillary issues that have developed. Uh, and one of them is uh, when you have people who uh, are put in this situation immediately with no notice, uh, it has caused serious mental health issues. You have anxiety, depression, insomnia, loneliness, uh, that feeling of isolation, we're seeing the use of drugs go up, we're seeing the use of alcohol consumption go up. Uh, this is a chronic problem. If you're feeling these uh, issues, you're not alone. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, half of all Americans have said that their mental health has been negatively impacted. Don't underestimate the stress of this situation. 
uh, and it happens on a lot of levels. Three out of four say that their sleep has been affected. You don't know where the, your next paycheck is coming from. You don't know if your job is going to exist. Uh, you're at work one day. The next day, they say everything is closed. Stay in the house. You're in that house in a confined uh, situation, or you're in an apartment in a confined situation. You can't get out. Uh, it's difficult. For emotional uh, support, we have a hotline that is set up. People shouldn't be uh, uh, shy in any way or have any second thoughts about calling for help. It is a pervasive problem, and uh, people should make the call and get the help if they need the help. We also see in line with what we're talking about, a dramatic increase in the incidence of domestic violence. There was a 15% increase in March, a 30% increase in April. That's March is when this started, 15%, April, 30%. That is a frightening rate and level of increase. Again, New Yorkers in need, we have a domestic violence helpline, 844-997-2121. Uh, you can call, just discuss the issue. You don't have to give your identity. You don't have to say where you live. Uh, but people who need help should reach out. Uh, there is no shame in reaching out and saying, I need help. This is a national epidemic. It's a statewide epidemic. Uh, ask for help, and we're here to help. We're especially concerned about these issues for frontline workers. I mean, just think about what the frontline workers are going through. Think about what the healthcare workers are going through. They're working extended hours. They're seeing a large number of people die. They're working in very frightening situations. They're worried about their own health. They're worried if they get infected, they then have to go home. Worry if they're infected, are they bringing that infection home? So this is a terribly stressful difficult time, especially for the frontline workers, uh, and we want them to know that we not only appreciate what they're doing, but we're there to support them, right? Saying thank you is nice. Uh, acting in gratitude uh, is even nicer. So we have a special emotional support uh, hotline for our essential workers, and we're also going to direct all insurers to waive any cost-sharing copay deductibles for mental health services for essential workers, which means the mental health services will be free for frontline workers, uh, and they'll be at no cost. And uh, too many people, too many families have said to me, well, you know, I, I would go for services, but uh, I don't want to pay the cost, I can't afford it. I don't want to take that money from my family. That's gone. There is no cost to get mental health services. Uh, so just wipe that reason away uh, and get the help that you need. It's even on, uh, if it's even in the best interest of your family. Uh, last point, personal opinion, who said when life knocks you on your ear, learn, grow up, and get back up. Was it A.J. Parkinson? It was not A.J. Parkinson. It was me. Nobody ever said that. Just me. When life knocks you on your rear, dot, 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 learn, grow, and get back up. Uh, this has been a very difficult, difficult situation for everyone. But when life knocks you on your rear, learn and grow. And we will collectively learn and grow. We're, we're going to learn many difficult lessons from this situation. Uh, we're going to learn about public health threats that we never saw before, we never heard of, we never really anticipated, we never actualized. Everyone talked about global pandemics and that possibility. But you know what? Until it happens, uh, people don't really get it our hospital system and how that works and how it works in an emergency, how teleeducation works, how telemedicine works, how you keep society functioning during an emergency, uh, how you communicate 
to people the dangers of a situation without panicking people because you still need essential workers to come out and do their job. You don't want to panic people where they say, I'm not leaving the house. But you need to communicate the facts so people act responsibly. Uh, how do you do that in a short period of time? What do you do about public transportation? You learn the whole lesson with the downstate public transportation system. So there'll be a lot to learn from this, which we will learn, and we will be the better for. I believe that. Uh, and that's, that's part of life. In the meantime, we have to go day to day, and we try to make the best of a bad situation. You try to find that silver lining through the dark clouds. All of us try to do it in our own way. Uh, everybody is, is struggling with it in their own way. Uh, and that's all across the board. In many ways, this is the great equalizer. It doesn't, doesn't matter who you are, where you are. Uh, this impacts your life uh, dramatically. But personally, if, if you work at it, maybe you can find a little silver lining. I'm sitting there last night with my daughter, Michaela. She's my baby. The baby is now 22. And she says to me, you know, Dad, uh, think about it. I've spent more time with you now than I will probably spend with you in the rest of my adult life. I said, wow, what does that mean? She said, well, think about it. I've been with you for over a month. I won't be with you for another month for the rest of my adult life, which is kind of jarring because I still think of her as my baby. But you know what? That's probably right. You know, she's 22. She's going to go off, do whatever she does. And then you see her at holidays for a few hours here. Maybe you steal a Saturday once in a while. Reminded me of the uh, Harry Chapin song, Cats in the Cradle, which was a great old song uh, from a great, great man, great New Yorker, too. But these are with all the bizarreness, I haven't been able to see my mother in two months, but I have my daughter probably for a longer period of time than I'll probably have for the rest of her adult life. That's probably true. So you try to find the silver lining. You try to stay positive. We stay socially distanced, but we stay spiritually connected. New Yorkers, have been so supportive of each other. You can feel it. There's a spirit of community and mutuality. People are there to help one another. People understand that everybody's going through this. Everybody's in stress. You look at the way people have complied with these rules, as annoying as they are, masks, six feet, this. That's out of respect one for the other. I love the metaphor of the mask. The mask does not protect me. I wear the mask to protect you. What a beautiful sign of caring, of mutuality. I wear a mask to protect you. Uh, that's, that's the spirit, even in this terrible time of difficulty. So yes, you can be socially distanced, but you can be spiritually connected and closer in ways you've never been before. And I believe that's where we are. Because we are New York tough, which means tough, smart, united, disciplined, and loving. Questions? Governor, Governor, Governor. 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 states start to submit their reopening plans. Could states start to, re uh, could schools start to reopen um, as early as this fall, possibly sooner? Um, and uh, we're hearing that New York City, their teachers are looking at remote learning possibly in the fall. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering about the timeline of all this and what could happen at the earliest. There will be no opening of any school in the state for the remainder of the academic calendar year. We have to decide on summer school. That decision will be made by the end of May. Uh, there is no decision on the fall because the fall is a long time away. Yeah, when, will states, when will schools start to have to be submitting their plans by? It depends when they're going to open. But they should start preparing their plans now because this is going to be a real exercise, you know.
we're talking about how manufacturing companies socially distance, how construction companies socially distance. How does a school socially distance? You know, this bizarre setup here, right? I look at this room. How do you run a school like this? How many more rooms would you need to do this? How many more buses do you need to, to socially distance on a bus? You know, there's a whole, how about a cafeteria? There's a whole set of questions. How about a dorm room? So they should start working on those plans now. How do you ensure that free and available child care? To follow up on what Marina is asking, do you think that teachers can realistically do this and school administrators? I mean, kids are kids. They're going to want to run around and be together in a school setting. Well, look, that, that is a very good question, Karen. And that's what we, you know, talking to people all across the state, educators all across the state, you can come up with a plan, which is, by the way, very hard, right? They talk about spatial requirements. If you did this, if you required this in a classroom, how many more classrooms would you need in a building, right? But then there's the other question of uh, K to 12, and then how do I get students not to socially distance? You know, how do you tell a 10-year-old to socially distance? So uh, we're going to err on the side of caution now. That's for the rest of the school year. Summer school, you would need to see, uh, in my opinion, a, a drop in the, or stabilization of the infection rate for a period of time because kids are going to be kids. I think you're right. It is in the time when the schools are going to lose money. You guys are already talking about cuts. I mean, how are they going to manage all this? They would, you know, need more classrooms. They don't even have the money for well, that right, right now. Well, you couldn't get to more classrooms anyway, right? You couldn't build more classrooms in a way that would have any difference for summer school or for the fall. Uh, and uh, money is going to be tight, depending on what Washington does. Uh, and they're doing remote learning. You know, the uh, fiscal consequences are going to be mixed because of this period. Some ways they save money, some ways it costs money. Governor, do you, uh, sorry to harp on this, but do you, do you anticipate a decision on on pause this week again in terms of businesses? May 15th is the decision on pause. So you put, will you announce it prior to that or? Uh, we'll announce it prior to May 15th. And also, just to, just to follow up, it's been two months since the first case was reported. You spoke today of what we have accomplished. And yet there's 18,000 people dead at least, uh, over 300,000 people sick. How would you evaluate your performance during this crisis? Tried my best. Should New Yorkers expect that to happen here as well? Well, we're, very, we're aware of what New Jersey's doing, what Connecticut's doing. We're trying to coordinate with those states. I've said from day one, uh, the, you will not have uniform policies across all the states, but knowing what other states are going to do, because a state can have a, a significant effect on a neighboring state, Knowing what they do is helpful. Uh, and then at the appropriate time, we'll make those decisions. The decisions around summer activities are very difficult. You want to look at the tension. You want to get people out of their homes, give them something to do, but you want to keep the infection rate down. Uh, you have these mental health issues. You have domestic violence issues. You have a lot going on. So you do want a relief valve, right? It's going to get hot in the summer, uh, hopefully, and uh, you want to have a level of activity. You don't want to overwhelm a neighboring state by keeping everything closed, but you don't want to have high density uh, and violation of social distancing. So that's, that's what we're trying to work through for the summer activities. We have a little more time, and we're talking about that now. <laughs> just, Jesse, to go back, just go, Jesse, to go back to your question for a second. Uh, I can tell you this, New Yorkers did an extraordinary job and reduced the rate of hospitalizations by about 100,000 uh, and saved thousands of lives. So kudos to New Yorkers. So what's, what's the geriatric center? It was, um, they had around 
100 suspected coronavirus deaths, but the state only had around 13 on hand. They had bodies outside in storage containers. Is there going to be an investigation into the Isabella Geriatric Center, and uh, is there a way that there can be more investigation into some of these coronavirus suspected deaths? Well, we have the joint effort between the Attorney General and the Department of Health that is going to investigate uh, systemically how nursing homes handle this situation and specifically uh, individual problem areas that we've seen in nursing homes. So that will certainly be part of the Attorney General and the Department of Health investigation. Well, will, it, will it be an investigation into that specific nursing home? Do you know the facts well, we have 613 nursing homes. We investigate anything that comes up. If there's a concern, we will go in there, find out, and report back. But how many deaths are going into hospitals? Is there a way to connect those from hospitals? I mean, some of these deaths are saying are in hospitals, but they're actually in their, from nursing homes. Is there going to be more of a, um, I guess, uniform way of reporting these deaths? There is a formal. There, I understand your question. There is a formal process of of how we go in to investigate, uh, try to find out what happened. What were the events? What could we do to prevent that in the future? Uh, and we're addressing all of them, and whether it's tied to a hospital, tied to the nursing home, or both. Yeah. And just, just so you're clear on the facts now of what we're doing, you, we report hospital deaths and nursing home deaths separately. Uh, that's on the slide every day. The question we're now asking the hospitals, one of the questions that I posed, uh, was someone transferred from a nursing home to a hospital uh, and then passed away in the hospital? And we want to know that. That's, th that's your question, and that is a good question, and we're going to be asking that uh, today. And when I get on the phone with the hospitals, I'm going to ask them just that question. Well, that sure but on that about the importance of protecting essential workers, you're disinfecting subway cars and, and, and buses in New York City. We're hearing from essential workers in grocery stores who tell us they're overwhelmed by people who are rushing into the store, who are not wearing masks, who are not practicing social distancing. Um, and so I guess the question is, should these stores be refusing to allow customers in who are not wearing masks? And if uh, one of those essential employees is fearful of showing up for work, can they be denied unemployment benefits? The unemployment benefit denial, I don't know. Maybe it's a legal question. I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, Melissa or Rob would know, or we can check. Uh, look, on the grocery stores, if I'm a private grocery store owner uh, and we have these social distancing requirements in place and masks in place, I think, unless the lawyers want to argue with me, if I'm a private grocery store owner, I would deny admission to a person who is not uh, wearing a mask. You could endanger my other patrons. You could endanger my employees. Uh, uh, I would do that. I don't know about the behavior inside a store, you know, but uh, I think the private grocery store owner would be in their rights. Summer school you talked about for those students who failed or for everyone? Summer school, they will do remote learning. They have to continue to do meals, et cetera. We're talking about summer school attendance in the building. Could you, Bernadette? Commissioner Zucker, also explain the discrepancy between the nursing home reported deaths? Because as a follow-up to Morgan's question, that specific spot, there's only 13 reported deaths from, nurse, from that nursing home on the COVID tracker. However, we've got a report that they had 26 or 46 deaths specific to COVID and then potentially more in the 50s. So what's what's the explanation for that discrepancy and what are the consequences for What's that? the name of this nursing home, Bernadette? It's called the Isabella Geriatric Center and it's in Manhattan. Does anyone know? Jim? We asked, we went back and asked the nursing homes to provide more detailed data. What they were doing in some cases and not others confirmed plus unconfirmed cases. So what we asked them to do is go back and say what were confirmed and what were unconfirmed. So sometimes the number is higher because those are actually unconfirmed cases that they put into certain reporting. We asked them for the confirmed at first, but to get at this sense of what you're talking about, which is why is the number a little higher, we asked them, do you also include unconfirmed numbers in that as well? And what we're finding is they were in also including unconfirmed. So what we're doing is putting together a data set right now that has it by confirmed by nursing home and unconfirmed like we were doing with the others too, but that takes a little time to tease out from the nursing homes. This is coming directly from the nursing homes. I'm concerned that that large gap, 13 versus almost 50, 
deaths that are being reported, that's a very large number. Are there consequences in case nursing homes are not reporting the accurate numbers, and what are those? Commissioner? So we, you know, this is, an, as Jim mentioned, there's two parts to this, but this is an evolving situation of the data that's coming in, uh, and we do track this. If there's a concern about a specific nursing home and what the numbers are, we will look into that as well. What are they facing? What penalties, though? They could, Bernadette, they have to attest to the fact that the numbers are true and accurate in every report they submit to us. If the commission at the Department of Health finds that there was intentional misleading or whatever, they can revoke their license, they can find them penalties under the public health law, they will send people in. I think under this specific instance, the Department of Health will go in and investigate this to see, like we've done with others as well. Sometimes, as the governor and others have said before, this was an emerging situation. There were mistakes made on reporting. Some people reported deaths from December. That's a mistake. Other cases, there were, if there's potential intentional misleading, the Department of Health will investigate those and then do the appropriate actions. So let me, let me, let me give you the answer, former Attorney General. They have, are giving you two sets of numbers, right? Conf uh, confirmed COVID deaths is one number. Then unconfirmed possible COVID deaths, which is this vague category. Uh, maybe the person died of COVID, but we're not sure. Uh, so unconfirmed deaths, which is a vague category to define. Uh, and hospitals are doing the same thing, by the way. The local governments have to uh, submit unconfirmed potential COVID deaths. So that's a little squishy by definition. Uh, and then I can, I can see uh, where there's a, a, a vagueness in that category. But they submit these numbers under penalty of perjury. You violate, you commit fraud, that is a criminal offense, period. So they can be prosecuted criminally for fraud uh, on any of these reporting numbers. John? Are you concerned because you have been saying the past two months nursing home de nursing homes will be like fire through dry grass? Um, are you concerned that there is this vast gap between the reporting and also what has the state been doing the past two months to alleviate that? Or has this been mainly a county well, level thing? A you facility? can't. You can't. Conf you can't alleviate when they put possible, or probable, or unconfirmed cause of death. That, by definition, you're asking them a vague question and they're giving you a vague answer. So there's not, they could argue that's not fraud because they did not know. You're asking them for cause of death. They're saying it's unconfirmed, it's possible, it's probable. Uh, but if they misrepresented, then you have a criminal fraud case. John? You said, Governor, regionally, uh, you, you said reopening, lifting the pause of, uh, order will be done on a regional basis as we shift into phase one. So why isn't the school opening or school closure decision made on a regional basis as well? Because it's one thing to say you can figure out how to socially distance in construction uh, or say you can figure out how to socially distance in a manufacturing facility with adults and you can figure out social distancing, et cetera. To say we're going to figure out that plan and put it in place in the next few weeks uh, is virtually impossible. You know, you can't, you, you can't get, just think of a school facility, right? And again, go back to this room. Uh, you have 30 kids in a classroom. But with social distancing, you can only put 10 kids in a classroom. Okay, then get another three classrooms with another three teachers. I can't. Uh, cafeteria, at lunchtime, I put 200 kids in a cafeteria. Well, now you can only put 70 kids in a cafeteria. So have them eat in six shifts, you know, and figure all this out and get it done in a few weeks. And make sure you don't make a mistake because we're talking about children and we're talking about them getting infected and, and bringing a... Uh, uh, either getting sick themselves or bringing it home. So the stakes are high. You said in the past, though, you said in the past that, that you can't get to a full phase two of the reopening unless you have school for schools open from a child care standpoint. Does that mean that we won't get to a full phase two in any area of the state by the end of the academic year? Well, you're, 
during the academic year you would need to get to a full phase two the schools to be operation right you can't say ok everybody in the state go back to work but the schools are closed it be very hard for part of the workforce to do that uh, but you're at the end of the school year anyway here in a few weeks right and then you're in the summer months, and then the big question is going to be September. Are you ready to reopen the schools in September? Uh, and if you don't, then you can argue you're not going to be ready for a full business opening if you're not opening the schools in September. I think that's true. Governor, just press the Governor, Let's, so Let me just make sure everyone asks a question. I have two questions. I hope you'll answer both. Um, first off, I, I mean, there's a huge protest. This time, there's two protests going on outside. I know you can hear this time, because I can hear in here. Uh, so I went and talked to them. I wanted to know what was going on. One is Reopen New York State, who you've already heard from. The other is Citizen Action New York, and they are asking you to cancel rent. I asked the organizer how, how it would be funded, and she suggested that you tax billionaires. Is, is this idea feasible, and what is your response to that group of protesters that are lying down Washington? Yeah, look, you have protesters in front of this building on a continuing basis. You think these are protesters. You know, there's several dozen. You come when we're doing a controversial bill, we have hundreds of protesters all filling the entire building. It's like the building vibrates with the chance. Uh, and that's, in some ways, great. That's democracy. People have an opinion. Uh, last week, you asked about the protesters who wanted everything open. The other day, you asked about protesters who wanted everything closed. That's what you get. One day, it's everything open. One day, it's everything closed. Uh, my point is, I get their political opinion. I get the political spectrum. I hear them. I understand why people say, liberate New York, open everything up. I understand why people say, clo uh, close everything. Uh, you're going to kill my children. You know, so I get the arguments. And what I said is, this is not a political decision. Let's make a decision on the facts, et cetera. I get the people who say, uh, nobody should have to pay rent. I get that argument. I get the landlords who say, and the building owners who say, if nobody pays rent, I'm going to walk away from my building, and then it's going to be vacant, and I'm not going to pay any bills, because if they don't pay rent, I'm not paying bills, and then you're going to have collapse of buildings. What, what we're doing is no one can be evicted for non-payment of rent between now and June, period, period. If a person can't pay their rent because of the situation, they cannot be evicted. That is the law till June. That law is in effect till June. And between now and June, we'll see what happens. We'll figure it out. Then we'll figure out what we need to do in June. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, last one. Go ahead. Hospitals have to report to the state where people are coming from when they're sick with COVID, their addresses, occupations. We're now two months into this outbreak. Why didn't we require that sooner when we could have tracked it more, I guess, feasibly? We have some of the information, but this is now going to be an extraordinary. When I get on the phone with the hospitals, they're going to say this is a, an extraordinary uh, reporting requirement, right? You had emergency rooms that were overwhelmed. You had administrators who were overwhelmed, uh, working 24 hours a day. To get this level of granular detail on people who were walking in the door and get it to us on a nightly basis, this is going to be a significant administrative burden on them. Uh, are they essential workers? There's no such thing as an essential worker before this. Uh, how do they commute? That's a question that I don't think has ever been asked of a patient before, you know. Uh, if you are an essential worker, where do you work? 
you know, these are not questions that the healthcare system uh, ever asks. Uh, but since it's down to 1,000 new cases per day, I'm going to say to the hospitals, I understand it's a burden, but uh, it's 1,000 people statewide. It's only several hundred in downstate New York. I understand the burden. The volume is a little lower. This is a little granular. It is, is more detailed than anything you've ever done, but it's important for us to get it now so we can come up with a more specific targeted plan. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, I'll see you, I'll see you tomorrow. Some of the camp decisions will follow the regional decisions. Whatever we do in that region will apply to the summer camp. Thank you, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Thinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Times of uncertainty. Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers. Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Millions of Americans woke up to a new normal today as some states start to scale back their lockdown orders. The White House's federal guidelines on social distancing expire today, prompting at least 33 states to ease their own restrictions in some way or another. And according to a survey conducted by Northeastern, Harvard, and Rutgers universities, an overwhelming number of Americans oppose reopening the country's economy immediately. Only 7% of respondents said they would like to see the U.S. resume business activity right now. 
In Detroit, the number of coronavirus deaths has surpassed 1,000, giving it more deaths per capita than the epicenter, which is New York City. Uh, that did not stop protesters, though, from descending on the state capitol in Lansing, Michigan, demanding an end to the state of emergency that has shuttered most of Michigan businesses. In a digital town hall, Governor Gretchen Whitmer defended the strict measures and proposed their extension for another month. The worst thing we could do is to abandon all social distancing, to pretend like we are done with COVID-19 and resume life as it was. That would lead us vulnerable to a second wave. While Michigan's state of emergency is in line with the federal health advice, protesters still say that they object to Whitmer's reasoning behind the shutdown. I can understand uh, the, uh, the, the, what, what she feels is the need for this, uh, but I, think, uh, I don't think it's really backed up with, uh, with science and, and statistics uh, for, for the necessity of, uh, of a complete shutdown. Republican lawmakers in Michigan say they intend to sue the governor over the state of emergency. Protesters, including heavily armed groups, tried to enter the Michigan House of Representative chamber yesterday, but were stopped by police. President Trump says that he has seen evidence that the coronavirus originated at a lab in Wuhan, China, but he cannot make that evidence public. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence says that they are investigating that theory. So earlier today, we spoke to Ben Tracy about what the president had to say about that investigation, as well as other comments he made about the coronavirus. Well, the president basically blames China and the World Health Organization for not giving out enough information early on about the spread of the coronavirus. But this is different from what the president did say early on. He, you know, back in January, back in February, he was praising China. He was saying that they're being transparent and that President Xi was doing a good job handling this virus. Uh, and yesterday here at the White House, the president basically intimated that he was praising China because he was trying to get the trade deal done at the time. And now that that is done and he is seeing more evidence that perhaps they withheld information, he is being more critical. What was striking yesterday was that the president said that he has seen credible information that this came out of a lab in Wuhan. He would not say where that information came from because the office of the director of national intelligence has said that they have not concluded that yet. And even Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said yesterday, we don't have the answer to that question. So the president seems to have seen something or says he has seen something that the others have not. Yeah, it was sort of striking as well, Ben, to see the president of the United States when he was made aware of uh, the director of national intelligence statement with regards to that demand to know who released the statement uh, to the reporter who asked that question. Uh, uh, what was also striking, Ben, uh, as you know, presumptive Democratic nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden, denied a sexual assault allegation against him in an interview this morning. Uh, the president was asked about uh, the former vice president yesterday and a, un, you know, a not typical muted response from the president of the United States. Presumably, Ben, as this uh, uh, race for the White House heats up, if the president is going to go after uh, Vice President Biden for this allegation, he's going to have to do a lot of explaining about the dozens of women who have accused him of similar uh, assault and uh, inappropriate behavior. Yeah, this is not a subject matter that the president particularly enjoys talking about, but we should note that his campaign is very much going after Joe Biden on this topic. But the president, you're right, it was kind of striking. He was asked about this yesterday. He could have unloaded on Joe Biden if he wanted, but he basically said, you know, this allegation may not be true. He said that he, the president, knows a lot about being falsely accused. That's what he said. Uh, we did speak with uh, the counselor to the president, Kellyanne Conway, just a, a little while ago here at the White House. Uh, she did not uh, share the president's thought on this. She said Joe Biden should release all documents that are uh, at the University of Delaware. She said that all women should be believed and that if the Democrats want to say that when it's somebody accusing a Republican, then they have to be consistent about it. So right now, the president is the only one who is actually uh, kind of saying that this might not be true and we should give, uh, you know, Joe Biden time to, uh, to respond to it. Let me just say, Ben, real quick, Marie, before we jump, we move on. 
to this. Mm -hmm. I just want to uh, just say one thing about that, uh, Ben. As you know, uh, the former vice president today on the interview that he gave on MSNBC did say that he was requesting for the United States Senate, which he says is where uh, the complaint, the allegation would have been made um, by Tara Reid. He has called for the Senate uh, to release any and all records with regard to that, although uh, he was pressed on why not allowing the University of Delaware, which apparently has some of his papers there, um, uh, to, to do the same. So just to make sure that people understand that. Yeah, and I think, Vlad, that a little later on in the show, we're going to be sort of digging a little deeper into this one particular story because it's, it's a big one for today. Um, but I want to ask you about something we talked uh, earlier this week about, Ben. We talked about the vice president, Mike Pence, going to the Mayo Clinic and refusing to wear a mask. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a pretty big deal. It's the policy of the Mayo Clinic to wear masks. Everyone else was. Then he visited a factory yesterday and he was wearing a mask. We're hearing that the president is going to be heading to Camp David on the weekend. He's also going to be going to, I think, Arizona next week. Do we know if he plans on wearing a mask? Well, yesterday the president was asked about this. He said that he has no problem wearing a mask if the situation calls for it. So if he goes to this Honeywell plant in Arizona and a mask is required, he said he would wear one. He then tends to kind of go on about this and say, you know, if I have to give a speech, I don't know how I'd do that in a mask. And we should note, you know, when they first unveiled these guidelines here at the White House a couple of weeks ago about saying that Americans should be wearing masks when they're out there, the president was the first one who said, I'm not going to do it, and you only have to do this if you want to. So masks are not something that he has been real strongly behind. Um, so we'll have to see. I don't think you're going to see him wearing a mask as he gets on the helicopter here at the White House later today to fly to Camp David. As for the vice president, he did wear a mask yesterday. I'm told that the policy at that plant was made very clear to him. The vice president's office still contends that he was not told that he had to wear a mask at the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic says he was. Hmm. All right. Ben Tracy for us at the White House. Ben, as always, we appreciate your reporting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, it is International Workers Day today, and some essential employees are using this as an opportunity to spotlight the unsafe conditions they're working in during the pandemic. Nurses around the country are organizing a protest today. They say they're not receiving sufficient personal protective equipment while trying to save the lives of those diagnosed with COVID-19. Labor Union National Nurses United is organizing the demonstration. It says at least 60 nurses have died from the virus. The immune system plays a huge part in protecting humans from infections, but there is little information about its role in the coronavirus pandemic, which some experts say could last up to two years. So let's get straight to Dr. Bob Lahida. He is in New Jersey to answer some of our questions, which we are doing on a daily basis now and speaking to some of our medical professionals. So, uh, doctor, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, start by giving us a basic understanding of how immunity works. I think we're going to, for many of us, this is going to be a revisit of our uh, high school biology classes, but explain how it works and why it's so important and tell us how one could become immune to COVID-19. Okay, so this is fairly straightforward. When you're infected with anything, there's a, an immune response that is not specific. It's called the innate response. It's sort of like the body's SWAT team, and that attacks whatever the invader is, in this case, COVID-19 virus. About three to five days after the virus makes its appearance, it has on its surface proteins, which distinguish it from other coronaviruses and other viruses like influenza. These proteins set up an adaptive immune response, which means your cells in your body make antibodies to the virus. And this antibody response should be specific and very sensitive. Now, there are all kinds of antibodies in your body, but the key ones that we like to measure are the M and the G antibodies. That tells us whether you've been infected recently or you've been infected a couple of weeks or months ago. And the antibody to the virus is called a neutralizing antibody, which means that it takes the virus and attacks it and neutralizes it. Now, this antibody response can be present for weeks and weeks after you've been infected. And that's what we want to test to see if people have been exposed or indeed infected by this virus. 
But doctor, it's sort of a little more complicated than that, right? Because um, the coronavirus, there are a number of different antibodies that some of these tests that are out there are, are testing for. And I, I think about, um, you know, the chicken pox, how they always used to tell you when you were a kid, if, once you, if you got the chicken pox once, you never get it, get it again because of, you know, you were exposed to these antibodies. But that doesn't mean you can't get sick again with something similar to the chicken pox. So do we have like an idea of how long you may be immune for if indeed these antibodies indicate that there's some kind of immunity? No, there's no actual timeline because we don't really much know much about COVID-19's responsiveness. But we do know, and you've got to remember that we all get the common cold, and that's a coronavirus for the most part. It's also a couple of other viruses like the rhinovirus, and we've never had a cure for the common cold, right? But we get them over and over again. We try to have neutralizing antibodies to viruses like influenza, but again, we can get that again. So our big concern and the WHO, the World Health Organization's concern is, can we get this viral infection again? And the answer is we simply don't know. We make antibodies, all of our normal immune systems make antibodies to this virus, and we would presume that we can neutralize the virus once it comes into our bodies. But we're not so sure that we cannot be reinfected later. The tests out of the Far East, like Korea, have shown that what they're measuring antibodies against 20, 30, 40 days out are fragments of the virus. So that scared a lot of people thinking that, gosh, the virus is available to reinfect anybody and you don't have symptoms, but you're shedding the virus. That's probably not the case for now, but we're worried about a resurgence of the virus back in the fall, just like influenza comes and goes, just like the common cold comes and goes. So that's my concern. I would be very happy to know that this virus is dead and that the antibodies have neutralized it. And once you have it, it's not gonna come back. And those of us who have had it that are asymptomatic, who have the infections without symptoms, are probably not going to get reinfected again when the fall comes around or the winter of next year comes around. That's what I'm hoping. So, Doctor, just to put a finer point on it, because I'm, I, I think there are a lot of people who, are, who have these questions, and sometimes it makes sense, as Anne-Marie pointed out, uh, to sort of link it to something that people are familiar with. So Anne-Marie mentioned chicken pox. Uh, yeah. Why the chicken pox is caused by the varicella uh, uh, virus. It's also a virus. But why, if we are infected as children, do we then develop an immunity to that particular virus? And what is so difficult about our bodies uh, doing the same when it comes to COVID-19? Well, we don't know about COVID-19, but you're right about the varicella virus. But there are people who have been reported to get chicken pox again, as we all know. So that virus can resurface. But for the most part, that varicella virus, we do become immune to. Um, and there are hopes, and I say hopes because we really don't have any knowledge about this, that once we're infected with COVID-19, that we will be immune for the rest of our lives because of the neutralizing virus. Now, this, uh, because of the neutralizing antibody, I'm sorry, the antibody, we, we presume the IgG antibody uh, is going to protect us, as well as other antibodies that your viewers may not have heard of, like IgA and IgE. We don't know what role those antibodies play with regard to this virus. And then we've forgotten about cellular immunity. We have a whole uh, bevy of cells, like natural killer cells that exist in our bodies that go right after the virus and are far more effective in destroying the virus than the antibodies are. The antibodies is what we can measure. Natural killer cells are very difficult to measure. We've got them, however, and I'm hoping that they're doing their job. So, uh, Doctor, there are all these sort of private companies now that are uh, cranking out these um, antibody tests. Um, I, I think that's you know they're testing for different antibodies, and you you pointed out that that uh, sort of during the illness there are different antibodies that your that your body is sort of putting out. Um, and there's been talk of something sort of akin to an immunity passport, like if you test for an antibody and it, it turns out that you were exposed to the virus, then you're okay. Um, um, whatever that means. Can we talk a little bit about this concept of an immunity, immunity passport and the dangers that, that lie within that? 
Well, an immunity passport, I think, is not a good idea. I'll tell you why, because there's cross-reactivity between various coronaviruses. So if you have an IgG against a coronavirus, we're not so sure at this time that that's against COVID-19. It could be a coronavirus of a different type. There are many, many coronaviruses. It's a whole big crowd of viruses that have been existent for many, many uh, centuries and years that we've been exposed to. So an ID card doesn't necessarily mean that you were exposed to COVID-19. And that goes back to something called specificity. Specificity means the virus antibody has to be specific to that virus, the COVID-19. And then there's sensitivity. Sensitivity is a broad term, meaning that the immune system is sensitive to all of the coronaviruses, but why we need this antibody to be specifically directed to COVID-19. And then on your screen, I saw, I saw where you showed herd immunity. Herd immunity is what we want to see, and that means over 70% of the population has been infected and has antibodies. And herd immunity, we, we were seeing with the polio virus, and we were seeing with a whole bunch of other viruses. And this means that people will be exposed to the virus asymptomatically, and they will have uh, the herd, like a herd of cows or a herd of sheep, that humans will then have global immunity against this infection. And that's the perfect that's the perfect example of what we want to see going forward, which will protect all of us, put us all back to work, and everything will be back to normal again. So there is hope. Looking, looking forward to that. Uh, doctor, before you go, I know you got to run, but in 30 seconds or so, can you just explain why we continue to get flu vaccines every flu season? I get one every season to protect me from the flu. Um, so is that, could we potentially see something similar for the coronavirus, or would there be a cure, and once you take it, or once you develop antibodies, you're good to go? No, I, I think you're right on target there, right on target, Vladimir. You, the, the flu vaccine is given to us because the flu virus mutates. And as you know, every year, there's a little bit different kind of a virus that can infect us. We know about influenza A, and we know about influenza B, but we need to have a boost. Our adaptive immune system has to be shown the virus to provide us with a boost of neutralizing antibody. So for the most part, we're protected when we get our annual flu vaccine. I suspect COVID-19 is gonna be the same thing. And we're probably gonna package the two vaccines together so that when you get your flu shot in the fall and into the winter, you'll also get your COVID-19 flu shot once the vaccine's available. And that will protect all of us. Most of us realize that even though we have a flu vaccine, uh, and we're pretty immune to it, that we can still get, some of us can get resurgence of the flu infection. And it's not as severe, but it is protective to us and we will be infected. Now, when I say not as severe, it means that there may have been a subtle mutation in the virus over the year. So that's why we get the virus vaccine every year to protect us against mutations of the influenza virus. We're gonna see the same thing with COVID-19, which is already a major concern for us all. All right, doctor, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insight and knowledge. Racing fans uh, may have something to celebrate. Turns out that NASCAR is going to be revving its engines for the new season uh, really soon. So we're going to tell you about when you can expect to see uh, drivers hitting the track, but also, you know, what they're doing to make sure that drivers and fans and anyone else involved in this race um, stay safe. All right, that's after the break. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. 
go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Time. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences? Joining us now is the nation's top doctor, Surgeon General Jerome Adams. How soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? Making sense of our world. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Coronavirus misinformation can seemingly spread like wildfire online, but new research finds there are ways to combat inaccurate information. Sarah Fisher is an Axios media reporter, and she joins us now from her home to talk about this. So, Sarah, explain what researchers have discovered and walk us through what we've seen uh, the suggested action in practice should look like. Yes, thank you so much for having me on. So, essentially, we all thought after the 2016 election, when there was a lot of misinformation at that time, that we should label things as being true or false, and that would help the problem. But what researchers have found over the past four years is that actually can make it worse. When you use binary labels like true or false, you might incentivize people to click something labeled false just because they're curious to see what it is. It also politicizes the problem. Oftentimes when you're going out and labeling something true or false, because of the hyper-political environment, people take issue with it. They feel offended. You're calling my perspective wrong. So what researchers and academics say is better to do is actually just to provide a lot of supplementary information that's factual alongside the misinformation, allow people to get a little bit more context, and that way they can get exposure to the truth without you negating something and calling it false that might offend someone or incentivize them to click it further. Um, Sarah, I found your article so interesting um, because it sort of makes, explains this in a very, very scientific way based on the people who just focus on misinformation and how to combat it. I thought the point about um, misinformation reaching sort of 10% penetration into a population that you almost sort of, before you, before you decide to combat it, it needs to kind of be exposed to a certain amount of people, but not too many people in order to have um, an impact. Um, but, you know, a lot of people will say, look, this is about freedom of speech. It's about a conversation. You, you know, we the government doesn't always tell us everything, so we should be allowed to kind of research. Um, can we talk about how damaging incorrect information can be and why the WHO is so concerned? Absolutely. And you make a great point about the 10% theory, which is essentially don't waste your resources debunking something unless it's hit a threshold where it's actually a problem. And part of that research also said, don't focus on misinformation that's not really dangerous. I mean, there are a lot of rumors out there. How did the disease spread? But that's not what's actually dangerous right now. What's dangerous is misinformation about cures that could actually make it much worse and be even worse for your health. So it's prioritizing what to go after is a huge issue here. Uh, in terms of why misinformation is so damaging, we call what we're in right now an infodemic. You see that graphic on the screen. An infodemic is when you have so much misinformation that it's actually making the problem a lot worse. What we found with COVID is that there was so much, mis much misinformation about how you prepare for it that it made the problem worse. We were going out and saying, this is spreading like wildfire. And so in the beginning of the epidemic, people were buying up masks, 
and gloves and personal protection equipment that we really needed to go to the healthcare workers, which was making the problem even worse. And so I think the big solution, the big takeaway from this article is you need authoritative people, government officials, healthcare officials, to be giving people context, to be using scientific tools to combat misinformation, as opposed to just labeling something false. You know, as I read your piece, Sarah, and you know, we've talked, uh, we've talked often on the air and off the air about this stuff. Uh, you know, just sort of my caveman question, my caveman theory about all this is, you know, does a lot of it have to do with how? We receive information in 2020, and I know it sounds simplistic, but the fact that you know there have been multiple articles and even perhaps books that have been written about the fact that whilst we have the entire world at our fingertips, either through our computers or through our devices, because of the internet, you would think that that would make people smarter. You would think that that would provide people more information that is credible and transparent. But in fact, the reverse and the opposite has been true. As these, uh, as the internet has become all encompassing in our lives, we've actually become for lack of a better word, less smart because we are unable to vet so much of the information that is coming to us. And I know it sounds kind of um, simplistic to say, you know, perhaps people should still make sure that they have a good set of encyclopedias at home. Um, but, but really, it, it has to do with the way that we, we receive information. So short of, you know, completely deconnecting from the internet, what can, what can people do to ensure that they are not getting uh, misinformation that is suspect or bias? Such a good question. Well, the first part of this is that healthcare officials need to be pre-bunking or exposing people to correct information long before we have a problem in order to prepare people for when we do have a problem. So an example of that is when this pandemic first broke out, health officials told everyone, you need to wash your hands. Notice, Vlad and Emery, there wasn't a lot of misinformation about whether washing your hands actually works. And the reason is we've educated our population for decades that hand washing helps cure the common cold. But what we did have a lot of misinformation around was vitamin C. We have done a bad job as a society of educating people about the fact that vitamin C does not cure a cold. It can boost your immune system, but it's not a cure. And so we saw at the beginning of this outbreak, there was so much misinformation about go buy vitamin C, when in reality, that wasn't something that we needed to do. So first and foremost, health officials need to pre-educate people. Secondly, if you're a person who needs to figure out where am I getting my information? Is this misinformation? Is it not? The thing I would always say is go to credible sources where people use editors to vet information. A credible source may not be social media. Those are not news companies. Try to get your information from vetted news companies, you know, big broadcast networks, of course, but then also newspapers. Your local newspaper is a great resource as well. And just to add sort of one more thing, though, you know, the research that you talk about has a lot to do with, you know, credible sources and authority figures. But we have an issue here in which we have an authority figure, the president of the United States, who has delivered incorrect or un, um, unverified information. And doesn't that kind of throw a monkey wrench in everything? Yes, and this is why it's such an important role that Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Dr. Deborah Birx are playing right now, is that we do have a president who's been spewing misinformation, and so they are trying to kind of almost like clean up and you notice they're going everywhere. I mean, I was really impressed that Dr. Fauci was on the virtual NFL draft spreading proactively correct information about social distancing and the virus. What they're trying to do is they're just trying to be everywhere so that if authoritative figures like the president were to spew misinformation, they can go out and discount it. And also notice part of the research we did is you need as an authoritative health figure to go to venues where people are exposed routinely to misinformation. So if you're Dr. Anthony Fauci, going on a network like CBS, where there doesn't tend to be a lot of misinformation, that actually doesn't help you so much. That audience is not predisposed and exposed to misinformation. What they recommend someone like Dr. Fauci do is go to places like opinion shows on Fox News, where there is misinformation being spewed, speak to that audience and try to educate them there because they're the ones that were exposed to misinformation in the first place. 
Really, really great information, great reporting. Uh, Sarah Fisher uh, from Axios, as always, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, you too. Whole Foods says it will start providing customers with face masks inside its stores. The supermarket chain says the disposable masks will be available within the next week. All customers without their own masks will be provided with one at the entrance. Amazon, which owns Whole Foods, says it, invests, it expects to invest around $800 million by July in COVID-19 safety measures like masks, gloves, and thermal cameras. The 72-year-old man from England is now officially the oldest person to row across the Atlantic Ocean solo. Graham Walters will also earn a Guinness World Record for being the oldest person to row across an ocean more than once. Walters almost missed the record at the end of his trip in Antigua when the Coast Guard had to tow him due to strong winds. He started the journey back in January before the coronavirus outbreak became a pandemic. Now he's adjusting to a new life because of lockdown restrictions. We've talked a lot about sort of the uh, economic implications of this coronavirus pandemic. And, you know, one of the areas that are hit that ha have been quite been hit quite hard are the arts, because, you know, let's face it, it's not about survival, it's not about food, clothing, and shelter. So art kind of becomes sidelined. And the Association of uh, Art Museum Directors has temporarily changed its guidelines as institutions really, um, you know, suffer and buckle under the weight of the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So according to the Washington Post, the association is now allowing museums to sell their art to support direct care of their collections. Officials pre previously disapproved of museums selling art to raise money. The new guidelines also allows them to use money from endowment funds, trusts, or donations to cover general operating expenses. Um, these are sort of the little things that we don't think about. And um, as, as we all know, art makes a huge difference in our lives, particularly when we are dealing with trying times. Um, we, uh, we talked a little bit about the Getty Museum, how they kind of put out a little bit of a challenge for people to dress up like famous paintings and take pictures. And even though art may seem frivolous when you're just talking about survival, it's a very important thing to maintain. Uh, you know, you're absolutely right, Anne-Marie. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it's debatable whether or not uh, art and uh, things like it, whether it's literature or film or, or music, is not essential to the soul, as essential as, you know, uh, things that physically keep us well. Uh, the things that keep us mentally and soulfully well are in, uh, very, very important, I, I believe. And, um, you know, I, I hope that once this pandemic is finally contained, um, that, you know, all of us will flock back to those institutions that we love, like libraries, like uh, art uh, galleries and uh, museums. Um, and, you know, in, in some places like in New York City, uh, oftentimes you just have to give a donation. There's actually no fee to enter some of the, uh, the museums here, which are wonderful world-class museums, um, you know, that perhaps we will all change if we, if we can, if we can spare the extra money, understanding that millions of people are out of work, uh, to donate a little bit more um, of our dollars to those institutions that keep us uh, soulfully fit as well. Yeah, indeed. All right, so we have a lot more coming up. We're going to hear from the uh, WHO as it responds to uh, the way it has been dealing with the pandemic. Also, later on, we're going to hear from New York Governor uh, Cuomo again. You know, he does these daily briefings. Uh, people all over the country tune in, whether they live in New York or not. So we'll be bringing that to you as well. Let me remind you, if you have not already, to download the free CBS News app on all of your devices. You can watch CBSN anytime, anywhere, on any connected device. The app is free and so is our website. What a great deal. That website is cbsnews.com. We'll be right back. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. 
now. We need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. You gotta help each other out, no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Fauci. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Making sense of our world. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rena Ninen coming to you from my home studio. At least 33 states are easing their restrictions today after federal guidelines to slow the spread of the coronavirus expired overnight. For some states, that means loosening social distancing measures and reopening certain businesses, such as restaurants, even movie theaters. But other states are opting to extend stay-at-home orders. And that includes Michigan, where hundreds of people protested at the state capitol against the move. Carter Evans is in Huntington Beach, California, where the governor made the decision to close beaches after large crowds last weekend. The images we saw on a few of our beaches were disturbing. California Governor Gavin Newsom is cracking down, closing Orange County beaches over concerns that crowds last weekend were jeopardizing public health. When you pull back too quickly, you literally put people's lives at risk. But his order frustrated some Orange County residents. I'm going to come here anyway. What are they going to do? They're going to try and arrest me. And some local officials. Uh, were you surprised at the governor's announcement? I was a little surprised and quite disappointed. He's singling out Orange County. It's uncalled for. In Michigan, the Democratic governor extended the state's coronavirus emergency declaration by executive order Thursday night after the Republican-controlled legislature declined to do so. The worst thing we could do is to abandon all social distancing, to pretend like we are done with COVID-19 and resume life as it was. This after defiant protesters again demonstrated at the state's capital, demanding an end to the statewide stay-at-home order. At least six states recently extended their lockdown orders into May, but even more states have just relaxed their social distancing guidelines. That means businesses in some states are reopening with limits, potentially providing economic relief to some of the 30 million plus Americans that filed for unemployment in the last six weeks. In Texas, restaurants can begin dine-in services today, operating at 25% capacity. We just gotta make sure whoever needs to work the most is working the most at the moment. Chuck Gannam owns two House of Pies restaurants in the Houston area and employs 130 people. He says while they're ecstatic to come back, they're also being flexible. We're all happy that we're going to be back together, you know, but we just have to take as many precautions to make sure that everybody stays healthy as much as possible. Well, today marks just over two months since the first reported death from COVID-19 in the United States. Since March, the number of reported cases in the U.S. has grown exponentially. The country reported 89 cases back then. That number now swelling to more than a million today. It's largely in part due to increased testing capabilities. The U.S. death toll now stands at over 63,000. Natalie Brand reports on how President Trump is lashing out at China for the outbreak. President Trump claims he's seen credible evidence that COVID-19 originated in a lab in Wuhan, China. What gives you a high degree of confidence that this originated 
from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to tell you that. The intelligence community released a statement saying the virus was not man-made or genetically modified, but says it is investigating whether it began through contact with infected animals or as a result of an accident at a lab in Wuhan. One of two things happened. They either didn't do it and, you know, they couldn't do it from a competent standpoint or they let it spread. And, uh... I, you know, I, I would say probably it was got, it got out of control. The president says he's considering more tariffs against China because of the coronavirus. China responded, saying the virus is the enemy, not China. Domestically, a battle is shaping up over financial relief for state and local governments devastated by the pandemic. Some Republicans are pushing back against what they call a blue state bailout. I don't know that we should be working with states that have been suffering for uh, through bad leadership or bad management for 25 years, and I'm, we're supposed to fix that. This isn't about any other budget issues for states. It's about the coronavirus outlays revenue lost. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says state and local governments could need a trillion dollars. This is to allow us to keep firefighters, teachers, police, EMS on the payroll serving the communities in their hour of need. The Senate will debate the issue as lawmakers return to Washington on Monday, even though D.C.'s stay-at-home order has not been lifted. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. White House correspondent Ben Tracy joins me now. You know, Ben, the president is saying that this originated from a lab in Wuhan. We saw in your package that he said he can't provide the evidence of it. Then you've got the U.S. intelligence community saying that might not be the case. So where is the president getting this? That's unclear. Uh, the president said that he has seen credible evidence that it perhaps uh, came from this lab in Wuhan. But as you mentioned, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, their conclusion simply was that it was not man-made and it was not genetically engineered. But they very strongly said that they are still investigating its origins, whether it came from a lab in Wuhan or perhaps came from a wet market. Uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, he has also said that we don't know the answer to this question. Uh, so the president uh, either has seen a piece of intelligence from somewhere other than the intelligence community that leads him to say that he has seen credible evidence, but nobody else is backing that up at this point. You know, Ben, it was back in February where the president was actually praising China's response to COVID-19. What happened? What's up with the turnaround all of a sudden? Yeah, there's been a pretty uh, sudden evolution in his thinking on China and coronavirus. You're right. Back in January, back in February, the president was praising, praising them for doing a good job. He even said they were being transparent. He specifically said that President Xi was doing a good job handling coronavirus. Now the pres president has changed that. Now he's saying, you know, the situation that we're in is largely because of China and the World Health Organization not sharing information when they knew it. That's the president's opinion on the matter. Uh, so the president really has evolved on this. One interesting thing, though, is he still is not personally criticizing President Xi. When he's asked questions about, do you hold President Xi accountable for this, he really kind of dodges that and just uses China in general as his place where he's laying blame. Oh, that's an interesting differentiation. I want to ask you, though, Ben, for so long, the president's main campaign point for re-election has been a strong economy, and he's had strong footing on that. Now we've seen the economy take a different take. Is this part of a pivot to blame China? Is this part of a larger campaign strategy for the president? Well, I'll leave it to the political pundits to decide uh, if, if there's a link between the two. But there is no doubt that the campaign and President Trump are focusing a lot of their energy now on China. Uh, that should not be surprising. If you recall, the, when President Trump ran for president the first time, he focused on China. It was all about China ripping off the United States and how these trade deals were horrible and he was going to come in and fix it. Uh, you know, the president got that phase one trade deal back in January, and that's something he's very proud of. And he was hoping to have more of those trade deals before the election. That doesn't appear to be possible at this point now that we have this coronavirus and this war of words between China and the United States. But clearly the president is going to focus a lot of his time bashing China as he campaigns for re-election. And his campaign is very specifically trying to link Joe Biden with China, calling him Beijing Biden and saying that he's been soft mm. on China throughout his entire career. And therefore, the president is the better candidate because he is tougher on China. All right. And we'll have more on Joe Biden later this hour. But I want to thank you very much, Ben Tracy, for joining us from the White House.
Well, we want to take you live to New Jersey, where New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy is holding a coronavirus press conference. 46 patients, and they have treated a total of 380 of our fellow New Jerseyans since opening. There were 1,724 patients reported in either critical or intensive care, and this continues the overall trend from last week. Ventilator use currently stands at 1,286, and this is relatively, Judy, I think unchanged since yesterday. There were 532 new hospitalizations yesterday, and on discharges, 571 live patients were released from our hospitals yesterday. Their day-over-day day increase, but spot, pause there for a second. 532 people, as of 10, between 10 p.m. and 10 p.m., entered a hospital in New Jersey. So I want to open this place up as fast as anybody, but we have to keep in mind there are still a lot of people in hospitals and going into hospitals. The numbers are better, but they're not zero. And we need to get them there as fast as possible. Again, the numbers are showing positive trends. And these are the trends that we will need to see carried over in the coming weeks if we are to put ourselves on that road back and begin the restart of our economy. And again, I understand that people and businesses are anxious for a more specific timetable for when we can restart and begin to move forward. By the way, so am I. It's this simple. In addition to the precious lives, data determines dates. That means when we see our benchmarks on key factors like testing or hospitalizations, we can begin considering a specific timetable. But again, data determines dates. And I cannot stress enough how big a test this weekend will be in terms of keeping these trend lines moving in the right direction. And if you will, essentially an experiment on how we can together responsibly take that step forward. Even if it may be a baby step, it's an important one to get into our parks, to play golf, to see how we do. And if we do well together, uh, then we can most likely take other steps sooner than later. So let's do this together, folks. Today, with the heaviest of hearts, as we do every day, we are reporting 311 additional deaths from COVID-19. Our statewide total is now unspeakably 7,538 precious lives lost. As is our practice, let's honor some of those precious souls who we have lost. First, let's bring up a giant, Dr. Harvey Hirsch, a longtime and beloved pediatrician at the Center for Health Education, Medicine, and Dentistry in Lakewood. He was also a fixture at Mon Monmouth Medical Center. My wife was uh, formerly on the board there, and while did, she did not know him personally, she said he was, quote unquote, a legend at Monmouth Medical. He was known for his kindness and compassion and the respect he showed his patients and their families. He had been a practicing pediatrician for more than, than 30 years, recognized by New Jersey Monthly Magazine with its top doctor award in 2011, and by New Jersey Family Magazine as our state's favorite kids doctor in 2012. Look at the smile, Judy. Look at the stethoscope. Look at the tie. What a mensch. Despite concerns about his being exposed to COVID-19, he insisted on continuing to care for every patient who came for help, regardless, by the way, of whether or not they were a regular patient. And we lost him to COVID-19 on Tuesday. To Dr. Hirsch's wife, Mrs. Yehudas Simka Hirsch, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last night, she said a blessing for her was that all of their children were in and around her in Lakewood. And to everyone he cared for, may his memory be a blessing. Matthew Stare of Denville. Matthew looks like he's in a Mission Impossible movie there. Look at that. I love that. He spent nearly 18 years working in the Morris County Clerk's Office, most recently as assistant supervisor in the registry department, tracking real estate and historical documents. He is the first Morris County employee to pass from COVID-19. County Clerk Ann Grossi recalled Matt as a quote-unquote exemplary employee with quote-unquote genuine enthusiasm and as someone who took on any task. In fact, Matt enjoyed undertaking labor-intensive projects like a complete reorganization of the county clerk's map room 
as well as the cataloging of county real estate and historical records. I spoke with Matt's mother, Marty, yesterday, and that was, as you could imagine, a tough conversation to express our condolences to her and her family and all of Matt's friends. In fact, Matt's brother, Michael, his big, big brother, Michael, is also battling COVID-19 and recently was moved out of ICU. And so please, everybody, pray for Michael's continued recovery. His little brother, Matt, was only 38 years old, and his mom described what it was like telling big brother Michael about his little brother's passing, and it, it doesn't get any more emotional than that. God bless them all. And this is Cherie La, La Palusa. She was the beloved wife of a friend, Bayonne Third Ward Councilman Gary La Palusa. Sherry was a Bayonne original, born and raised. She is co-owner of her husband's landscaping business, and she also, pardon me, she was co-owner of her husband's landscaping business, and she also ran his civic association, organizing food and toy drives and dinners to celebrate the people making a difference in the community. And Gary is a guy that I've walked the streets of Bayonne with uh, together on more than one occasion. Uh, along with her husband, Gary, Sherry leaves behind her daughters, Jennifer, Gianna, and two sons, David and Gary Jr. As, as Gary said to me, we got four kids, three adults and a 12-year-old, and Gianna is the 12-year-old. And to each of the four of them and to Gary, our hearts and prayers uh, go out to you. And by the way, Sher Sherry was only 53 years old and was in the midst of the battle of her life, not just with her own health, but her mom is also battling this awful thing. Uh, and, and it was unspeakable. You know, Gary said there, he, there she was trying to save her mom's life, and, and, and in fact, she lost her own. So to, to Sherry, to Gary, to Sherry's mom, who's in our prayers, to their four wonderful kids and everybody they touched in Bayonne and beyond, God bless you all. These are three more of the faces COVID-19 has forever taken from us. We remember each and every single one. Again, as I said yesterday, more New Jerseyans than we have lost in most of our nation's wars and other cataclysmic events combined. It's a staggering toll. And I remind you that our flags continue to fly at half staff for all of them. And today, which is the first time this has ever happened since I've been governor, I signed an executive order that the flags today, in addition to all the victims of COVID-19, would be flying at half staff in the memory of former First Lady Debbie Keene, who passed last weekend. So to her, as our state's former First Lady, and to her husband, the former governor, and, and their children, including Senator Kane, God bless each and every one of them, and God bless uh, the families of those who have been lost and the memories and the blessings of the, those who have been lost to COVID-19. And may we all together continue our work together to stop this awful scourge and bring this to an end. Switching gears, today I am signing an executive order relaxing the in-person requirements for both the solemnization of marriage licenses for couples and for working papers for minors. On marriages, wedding ceremonies will be allowed to be held using video conferencing technology with certain safeguards. Municipalities are still permitted to allow in-person ceremonies, but subject to social distancing, but they will not be required to do so. Even in these times, there are joyous occasions like marriages that we can still celebrate safely and smartly. And for working papers, the requirement that school, uh, that school a district, district designated individual given person sign off is waived for this emergency. Obviously, the fact that our schools remain closed has made getting required sign-offs on these papers challenging for young people who wish to work. And as today is May 1st, May Day, I might add, I want to remind all renters that under an executive order I signed last week, you are able to have your security deposit used to cover your rent, either in part or in full. I read an op-ed by a citizen today in the Asbury Park Press that called me a despot. Uh, and I read the first couple of paragraphs to determine why I would be considered a despot. Uh, and it was the fact that I allow folks to get access to their security deposit. 
okay? I also want to reiterate that no renters are to be threatened with eviction throughout this emergency, and under no circumstances may any landlord even attempt to evict a tenant. No one should fear losing their home. In fact, we have set up a standalone page for renters and landlords on our information hub, covid19.nj.gov slash renter. I encourage you to make that your first stop. Before I th turn things over to Judy, I want to give a couple of well-deserved thank yous to some of our fellow New Jerseyans who continue to pitch in to help us through this emergency. First, let's meet Brooklyn Sherrill and Sam Halseth of Ocean City. They own a digital marketing firm called Shoreview Creative. But they're taking their creativity in new directions by organizing an eBay auction of one-of-a-kind custom-painted sneakers. And all proceeds will go to the COVID-19 Solidarity Response Fund for the World Health Organization. And by the way, this is kind of cool, neither Brooklyn nor Sam are native New Jerseyans. They moved here two years ago, each of them and their families from Minnesota, but they are now full-fledged members of our New Jersey family. And to each of them, New Jersey thanks you. If you look carefully, I assume that's Sam on the right. I just hope Michelangelo does not uh, sue for copyright infringement. I think that's a version of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, but those are extraordinary. Uh, look at them, just alive with energy, very cool sneakers. Uh, give, give them uh, your attention and sign up and participate in that auction and raise some money for an incredibly good cause. And finally, here's one from my neck of the woods and a place I know well, the Two River Theater in Red Bank. To support health care and social workers across Monmouth County, the costume shop staff, led by Leslie Sorensen, has taken to repurposing materials and outfits from past shows into masks. Additionally, the theater has been keeping its art mission alive by producing its own online daily artist features, at-home activities for kids and adults, and live digital classes and workshops. So to everyone at the Two River Theater, a particular shout out to founder Joan Recknitz and God bless her late husband, Bob Recknitz, who passed not that long ago, to artistic director, another dear friend, John Diaz, to everybody there, thank you for all you're doing to keep the arts alive and well, even if we can't visit you in person, which I hope we can do sometime soon. And that's as good a place as any to get ready to turn this, the, the, the program over. But before I do, again, I want to say again, please, remember this weekend is going to be an important one for us and an important sign for how we move forward and at what pace we move forward and get ourselves on the road back to restart and recovery. When the parks open tomorrow, please act responsibly and follow the rules and precautions. I want us all to be able to enjoy our parks together, even if we have to remain six feet apart, and even if we have to speak through face coverings. What I don't wanna do, please God, I don't wanna have to close those parks again. So let's do what you've been doing so extraordinarily well for these past so many weeks. Let's make this work together. And with that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Uh, thank you. Do not share your golf carts. Social distancing has helped us slow the spread of this virus. I know we're all eager, myself included, to resume normal activities and gather with our friends and families again. But we cannot abandon these vital measures that have helped us protect 
one another. Last evening, as reported, our hospitals reported 5,972 hospitalizations of COVID-19. This number has been in a steady decline. It is down 28% from a high of 8,293 individuals hospitalized on April 14th. There are 1,724 individuals in critical care. 75% of those individuals are on ventilators, which is slightly up from yesterday. Today, we're reporting 2,651 new cases uh, for a total of 121,190 cases in the state, and we're reporting 311 additional deaths for a total of 7,538 fatalities. The breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity is as follows. White, 52.6%, black, 19.6%, Hispanic, 17.3%, Asian, 5.3%, other, 5.2%. There are now 498 long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, dementia homes in the state that are reporting individuals with COVID-19. At the state veterans' homes, among a census of 696 residents uh, collectively, there have been 327 residents that have tested positive. And there have been four additional deaths from yesterday, two from Menlo Park and two from Paramus. At our state psychiatric hospitals, 161 patients have tested positive, And there have been nine deaths among patients uh, with a census of uh, 1,257 and that has not changed for the last several days. According to our lab data, uh, 2, uh, 229,693 individuals have been tested. 94,338 have returned positive for a positivity rate of 41.7%. So that concludes my daily report. Uh, again, uh, please continue to follow social distancing guidelines. It's making a difference. Stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Judy, thank you for that, and thank you for everything. The top counties as we normally hit um, in terms of total positive cases, Bergen followed by Hudson, Essex, Passaic, Union, Middlesex. I spoke to a, had an exchange this morning with Mayor Brian Stack in Union City. You know, the, while, and you, We've said this, the curves continue to go in the right direction, but you know, you're piling up uh, every day. Uh, and again, we're expanding testing dramatically, so that's part of the reason, uh, but we're not out of the woods yet, uh, right? The positivity number, just to remind everybody, it's now really going on two weeks that that's begun. Drift is the word I would use, right? It's been drifting from a high of around 45% down to about 41.1% today. So, And thank you for the reminders of the little stuff that we have to do. Uh, the, the very basic things that we have to make sure we're continuing to do. Let's not lose track of that. Staying away from each other, wearing face coverings, good hygiene. Those are all uh, the best weapons we've got. So thank you for that. Uh, another guy who I don't know where we'd be without, uh, Pat Callahan, please update us on compliance, on PPE infrastructure, other matters. I know there's one situation in particular you wanted to uh, give, give some clarity to that happened in Trenton here last night, so please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. With regard to overnight compliance, Newark Police Department issued 69 EO violations and closed one non-essential business in Point Pleasant. Uh, one subject was cited for having uh, the gym open, allowing uh, clients to exercise in New Brunswick. One subject was cited for the EO violation failing to disperse. In Passaic, uh, a subject was also uh, failed to disperse and was cited for an EO violation. In Mansfield Township, Warren County, the owner of a nail salon was cited for operating a non-essential business. Uh, in Patterson, uh, the owner was cited for having uh, a non-essential furniture store open. Uh, in Patterson, two subjects were cited uh, for also failing to disperse. In Passaic, the owner as well as two customers were cited in violation of the EO for uh, one the owner having a massage parlor open and to the two customers inside for uh, for uh, for being in it while uh, when the police arrived. 
in Clinton. I'll end with this one because it segues into another issue in Clinton. Uh, an elderly subject was contacted, uh, and this is a scam that we've seen a lot. It's not new, but I think the social distancing and, and physical and, and psychological isolation is having those prey upon our elderly with regard to what's referred to as a bail scam, saying that uh, her grandson was lodged in bail and needed $5,000. The subject did actually put $5,000 in the mail. That was subsequently stopped by the U.S. Postal Service. Um, but I just want to put it out there from a, a situ situational awareness. Uh, no one should be, be sending uh, via mail or wiring funding. I know the Attorney General's uh, the task force they put together with regard to fraud are looking into this. Um, and again, it's not a particularly new scam, but, um, but I think they're preying upon uh, the elderly in a time when that isolation uh, leads to the elderly wanting to take care of their loved ones. So I just flag that for, for everybody out there. And lastly, to the governor's point with regard to the incident last night uh, at the Anderson Funeral Home, just to clarify a few facts with regards to that, there was a total of 18 decedents, not uh, 19 as previously reported. Uh, state police personnel, in addition to Trenton Police and the Mercer County Prosecutor's Office, did respond there. There was not to be found anything of any criminal violation uh, under the uh, after the assessment done by state police personnel and the others there the Anderson funeral home transported 11 of those decedents to the central temporary morgue site uh, I think it should be noted that Anderson uh, had previously used that temporary morgue site as well so it's they did know it was there this was uh, simply a, a case where they just got overwhelmed seven of the dec decedents were permitted to remain there because their funeral service are being held over the course of the next three days uh, just and in response to that we had remessaged what we had put out over the last few weeks to the funeral directors association New Jersey Hospital Association long-term care as well as our county OEMs all of the guidance that we put into uh, the efforts and I know you've heard me speak to it over the past several weeks on mortuary affairs not a not a topic we want to discuss but we have spent a lot of time and resources to help assist uh, all of those that are struggling with uh, with the death associated with this brutal virus and I just wanted to remind everybody of that and set the record straight with regard to what happened last night at Anderson Funeral Home. Governor. Pat, thank you, and I appreciate your doing that. Um, two quick comments. We'll start, Brendan, over here with Dustin for our, before we do, go to questions. Um, two quick points. Number one, on schools, I can save you the questions. We'll give you word early week. My hope is on Monday as to what we're going to do about schools. So we've promised, we've said again for everybody uh, uh, to remind them that we have said that we're on remote learning until at least May 15, and we'd let no would let folks know at latest on May 15th what the balance of this school year looks like. Uh, we would hope to give you our guidance, not on May 15th, but I would hope Monday of t or Tuesday, I'm hoping on Monday, March, uh, May 4th, rather. Secondly, on just, I think, uh, Judy and Pat and, and, and Christine, it may bear repeating, just reading from the executive orders as it relates to parks and golf, and, and just want to make sure folks aren't surprised by things when they show up. So picnic areas, playgrounds, exercise stations and equipment, um, pavilions, restrooms, other buildings, facilities, visitor centers uh, will remain closed. So when you show up at the park, don't, as don't assume that stuff's going to be open. Parking will be limited to 50 percent of maximum capacity. No picnicking, social distancing, as Judy said, must be practiced, except only with immediate family members. Um, no organized or contact activities or sports, no gatherings. We're not making you, but we are strongly recommending that you have a face covering. Um, so that's, uh, th that's sort of the park picture. Please ex expect that when you show up, expect that those are gonna be uh, the rules of the road. As it relates to golf, um, I don't know that we've ever read this, so I'm gonna just read this out for you golfers who are getting ready for tomorrow. Um, Golf courses are open so long as they adopt minimum social distancing policies that include, and, the, the, and this is what is included in that, electronic or telephone reservation and payment systems, extended tee times that are 16 minutes apart, 
limiting the use of golf carts to one person, requiring frequent and after-use after sanita sanitization of high-touch areas such as restrooms, range buckets, golf carts, and push carts, implementing measures restricting the touching of the touching of golf holes and flags, such as putting pins in the hole, requiring, requiring that flags stay in and provide player education and not touching the flag, closing golf center buildings, pro shops, and other buildings and amenities, removing furniture like benches, water coolers, and ball washers from the course, discontinuing club and equipment rentals, limiting groups of, to two players unless the foursome consists of immediate family, et cetera. Again, let's start there. Don't be surprised when those are the parameters when you show up tomorrow. And again, like everything else in life, assuming we keep these curves going in the right direction and you all comply by the rules of the road, slowly but surely we'll be able to continue to expand either those, some of those rules as specific to parks or golf uh, and maybe as importantly, if not more so, take other steps based on hopefully a successful weekend. So thank you all for uh, listening as always. Let's start with Dustin. Thanks. Um, can you detail where the state stands on contact tracing and whether you know what percentage of people have had their contacts traced on beaches? Does the state have any recommendation on when they should open? I know that's a town by town decision, but if you have any general recommendations um, and what restrictions should be in place and do you have an opinion on towns that have taken action or are considering restricting beach access to residents only and then I have two questions from the press of Atlantic City uh, for uh, the health commissioner Hamilton Center for Rehabilitation has 147 infections one of the highest in the state have you figured out what led to the dramatic increase in the number of cases at that facility in such a short amount of time. Also, is this facility accepting patients that have tested positive for the virus? I'll give you a couple of thoughts and then, um, again, the general comment on contact tracing is it's a combination of boots on the ground and technology uh, to get it to the place alongside testing that we are gonna feel confident and be able to have you feel confident that we've got the right healthcare infrastructure in place, including a plan for isolation. Uh, Judy can comment about what's been done so far, but th those, those are sort of benchmarks. It's part of our road to recovery. That's one of the important points on there. I don't have a crisp answer in terms of how many boots, uh, ver nor which technology, but that's sort of the general thought. Um, beaches are a local decision with the exception of Island Beach. And I believe Matt Placken is with us, our chief counsel will tell us that a township actually cannot legally restrict folks from outside of their township. So that's actually not within their right to do so. And, but my guess is we'll be giving you pretty good and pretty s specific guidance on beaches, even those that are the overwhelming amount of which are not in our purview, uh, but not yet. Would you add anything to that, Matt? That, that's perfect. Okay, well, I'm gonna sign up for law school at night here on that basis. Um, Judy, anything on contact tracing and or the um, the, is it a nursing home specifically that you asked about, Dustin? Thank you. So, thanks. Sorry. So about the um, contact tracing, um, you know, we just want to remind everybody that our local health departments, ever since um, this has been an issue in New Jersey, and, you know, a lot of us have been working on this actually since around January, February, um, just to keep that in mind. We have had contact tracing efforts um, going on, uh, you know, for, for a very long time. And what the state is in the process of doing right now is um, you know in anticipation of uh, potentially identifying more cases because we're ramping up testing you know seek and test and then you'll you'll invariably find more cases we're in the process of um, trying to augment um, our contact tracing both um, in terms of uh, the manpower that would help assist with doing the, um, the contact tracing, because no matter what, you cannot replace that human element of doing the contact tracing. Um, and this is to help assist the already fantastic efforts that the local health departments have been doing. And, and it, I would be remiss by not saying that the local health departments have also been, during this entire time, have been identifying their own um, resources. They've already been augmenting their, uh, their staff at the local level as well. And what we want to do is we want to help them in the event that they need to meet more surge. And we also want to um, develop um, technology solutions that will help assist um, and to standardize and to augment 
again, um, you know, those um, contact tracing efforts because there's going to be a lot of data that has to be managed. And, um, you know, that would be the intent of um, having these additional um, data uh, technology supports to assist the local efforts. Judy, on, the, on this particular home? I, I can't speak to the particular home. I could probably look it up, um, but I can speak to the process that we're using for long-term care. Um, as you all know, and I've reported, uh, we uh, looked at 16 uh, facilities in the South, um, and we are following up. Uh, the, uh, the process is uh, test uh, and then retest all the negatives. Uh, so that we know exactly the status of the, part, uh, the residents and the staff in long-term care facilities. Uh, we've uh, as usual, we've separated out the state into um, um, north, uh, central, and south, and uh, we will be rolling out uh, testing, I think in about 30 additional long-term care facilities uh, over the next week. Uh, that's in collaboration with some of our health systems, uh, similar to what we did in South Jersey. But it will be a test and a retest, and there is indication that uh, for long-term care, over the long haul, there will be constant testing and retesting and retesting. If we could get back to you, I assume, on the specifics, Dustin, if, so, if Mahan could keep that in mind, it would be great. Sir, do you have us, anything up back there? Do you have something? Yes, hi. Uh, Dave Schatz uh, here with New Brunswick Today. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to uh, really um, acknowledge you for your extreme uh, energy and leadership. Uh, just this extreme focus is impressive in my mind, and thanks to the whole team. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if you That usually can comes with a but. I was wondering if you can uh, give a little uh, overview uh, uh, on the um, monetary policy um, and kind of put it into perspective of helping just uh, the general layperson understand, um, I guess, uh, the whole uh, easing of credit uh, and the Federal Reserve's actions uh, and Yesterday, uh, when you spoke with the president, you said uh, it was a partnership and we, we'd need 20 or 30, uh, what, billion dollars. Uh, is that part of uh, what the Federal Reserve is doing? Are we getting money uh, in combination with New York, with the author Improvement Authority? Yep. And... Um, Are we going to come out, you know, just totally in debt, or is it uh, aid? So may I? Thank you. Uh, thanks for your uh, good words. Uh, this is a, a health care crisis unlike anything the state has ever seen, and I think you could say with the same amount of conviction that the country has ever seen. And you might be able to say the same comment about the world. So our responsibility is New Jersey. Uh, and it has a health care crisis unlike any, and it has led to an economic crisis unlike any. And that includes both expenses that are going up, up, and up, because we are at the front lines, whether you're unins uninsured, uh, unemployed, pardon me, or you're a small business, uh, or you're a, a transit system or a hospital system, uh, or you're a municipality, county, or in our case, a state. Expenses are going up. Uh, and revenues have fallen, as you've seen, by any metric, either in our state or in the country, off the table, off a cliff. So the hole is enormous. Our best guess is that that hole between now and the end of next year's fiscal year, so this is between May 1 of 2020 and June 30 of 2021, is somewhere in that range. And we don't, we can't say a pinpoint of 20 to a hole of 20 to $30 billion, either created by increased expenses, foregone revenues, or a combination of each. And as I mentioned yesterday, I have to certify a budget, including that the revenues uh, that we, we put in a budget are adequate to meet the expenses. So in a funny way, 
foregone revenues is in fact, uh, in, in, a, in, in a, a different way to say that is an inability to finance our expenditures and outlays. So the, the levers that we can pull other than getting our economy open again and, and righting the ship, which we will do responsibly, but again, remember public health creates economic health, and it's got to be in that order. Some of the levers that we either are pulling or need to pull would be number one, the interpretation of the CARES Act, which was signed I think five weeks ago today that Matt has been leading with the US Treasury. We've made some good progress. They're coming out with more guidance, I think early week. Uh, we just hope that guidance allows us to use all the money that we, we, we need to use from that. That's one lever. It's a, a fraction of what we ultimately need. Another big lever is another bill to make its way through Congress, uh, both the House and the Senate, and to be signed by the President, a, a bill that we, we desperately need to include direct cash assistance for states. And again, as I made clear yesterday in the White House, and I would say again today, this isn't about our legacy issues. We had a, we and I got elected to fix the economy and to address the legacy issues that had built up over decades, from both sides of the aisle, by the way. And we had made an enormous amount of progress in our two plus years on record pension payments, managing indebtedness, rainy day funds, um, et cetera. We had a long way to go, but we have a plan. We had a plan and we have a plan. Uh, as I've mentioned several times now, our friend Mike Tyson says everyone's got a plan until you get punched in the face. What we need help with is recovering from the punch in the face. This is to help us to allow to, uh, to, to continue to have educators, firefighters, police, EMS, frontline responders at the point of attack to allow us to continue to have them on the payroll. Uh, and that's where that 20 to $30 billion number comes from. Uh, the alternative is an awful result, not just for New Jersey, but for America. Who, how, how can we even fathom a state where we don't have enough firefighters, police, educators, EMS folks, and if that weren't enough, that those folks are then all unemployed? That's just a, that's an alternative none of us can accept. Um, and so we need, the second lever is we need a very significant amount of money, not to deal with our legacy issues, we've got a plan for that, but with the here and now, to deal with our response to this awful virus. And then the third piece, and I've gone on too long, is the Federal Reserve did in fact, uh, about now four or five weeks ago, uh, for the first time ever, put forward a liquidity program that would allow them and envision them to buy municipal bonds. That is very attractive for us. In fact, we discussed it in the White House with the President and his economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, yesterday. And we've got some follow-up uh, on, on the back of that. Having the ability to borrow, even if it's a bridge borrowing, to, to, to allow us to borrow that, and then the federal direct cash assistance, God willing, could come in and help us pay that debt down. A, a recovering economy can help us get back on our feet and help us responsibly pay that debt down. I don't wake up in the morning wanting to borrow more money. In fact, we've spent over two years reducing our indebtedness, reducing our structural deficits. Uh, but this is a crisis unlike any other. We need to have the ability to access that. We need our legislative brothers and sisters to come along with us in that regard. We've made good progress. We need to make more progress. I could go on, but those are the three or four big levers. The CARES Act, we need a ton more federal direct cash assistance. We need access to that Federal Reserve borrowing window. And ultimately, and probably most importantly, we need an economy that's recovering, getting back on its feet, and generating again the sort of revenue that we have been generating to allow us to pay our bills. Thank you for that. We'll come down to Elise, please. Uh, good afternoon. The new supplies that were promised yesterday, the test kits and the swabs and the PPE, Will that be distributed throughout the state and is it coming via Operation Airbridge? And my second question, are we seeing an uptick in non-essential businesses staying open, you know, jumping the gun on when they could open legally? And how worrisome is that if that's a trend? Thank you. Um, I believe this is accurate and Pat will correct me on the first one. I think we have the supplies. Uh, I believe either we have them or they're about, to, or I, I believe they're if all they, here. If they haven't hit the hair air warehouse, they're en route, but it is not operation, I, it's not I, Airbridge, uh, and that strategy, at least, is being 
constructed as to, to the governor has always been saying we're trying to double our testing capacity, so that's being worked at uh, right now. But I believe we've got them, uh, and, and we'll come back, Mahan, come back to Elise if you could, if I'm not wrong about that. How they'll be distributed is to be determined. I think you, you heard us, you may have heard me say yesterday, Elise, that we're working on the testing strategy led, that's led by Judy uh, with a particular emphasis on things like uh, particularly deeply affected communities. So the, our correction system, uh, developmental di disabilities, uh, homes, psychiatric hospitals, long-term care, it, 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 a whole family there, an, another family of, of trying to activate um, a mobile sets of mobile units to go in particularly to our most densely populated urban populations. Uh, and then eventually we're going to want to get to the point, and I, I don't want to jump the gun because we're not there yet, and I'm, I'm practicing without a license. Uh, we want to be able to get to the broader asymptomatic population just to get a, a better epidemiological handle on this uh, virus, but more on that as we, as we develop it. Matt Placken, tell me if you disagree. If a non-essential business is operating uh, right now, they are out of compliance, and they should not be. Uh, and so I, I, am I worried? I'm not sure I'm worried, I'm mad. And so I, we need folks to go on covid19.nj.gov and tell us where those businesses are because we do not want that. Uh, and so Matt, anything you want to add to that? No, the, if a business is ordered to be closed, they have to follow the order and all businesses that are open have to follow the orders that you've laid out for strict policies regarding social distancing and other mitigation efforts to ensure that the virus doesn't spread. I don't want you to rat anybody out, but uh, any follow-up we could have and tell us where that is, we'll, we'll be glad to take it. Thank you. Sir, you good? Thank you. Ma'am, you're back to your normal spot, Ian. Uh, Governor, with uh, parks and golf courses being reopened this weekend, how will social distancing be enforced? Our viewers are curious if they'll be, in, if they'll be seeing police helicopters or drones monitoring parks. Uh, does a good opening weekend for parks pave the way for other institutions to open? Specifically, we're looking at any consideration to reopen casinos. Uh, Commissioner Persichelli, how involved does the state plan to get in antibody testing, and what do you hope to learn from it? What part does it play in the state's reopening plans? Thank you. Thank you. I'll start, and um, Pat, you may want to come in behind me on uh, compliance, and Judy, you'll certainly want to come in on with Christina on antibody. Um, I'll go to your second question first, if I may. A good weekend will matter a lot. I don't think it leads directly to casinos. I think we have to start, uh, Matt and I were having this conversation earlier, we're sort of developing, we're wargaming what, what a sort of series of rings of steps looks like. And I think it's fair to say things that are outdoors, Madam Commissioner, give us more latitude than things where we're all packed in on the inside. So I can't, I can't give you any sense uh, on the specifics as it relates to casinos. But I will say this, a good weekend and good compliance is going to matter. It's going to matter in the specifics as it relates to parks staying open, golf staying open. But maybe more importantly, it's going to matter if we get back. And by the way, folks, you've been great. So I just want to say that. Continue to be great. If we see, keep seeing those curves come down, we get those testing materials that are now uh, here. We get the contact tracing. You then start to see a lot of pieces of that road to recovery plan looking more real, and that's going to give us more latitude. Um, I'm not sure. We're, I, I don't know of any plans. Pat can discuss this on, on his drone strategy, uh, but we're going to have a significant presence. Uh, State Park Police, state police, local authorities, um, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and Pat may want to add some more color on that, but we're, gonna, we're watching. I just want to make sure folks know we're watching. We're not trying to be jerks. We're trying to watch and, and hopefully like what we see. The only thank you, Governor. The only thing I would add is almost daily you've seen in the compliance reports where a store owner or customers have done the policing or tried to on their own. And I would hope that that continues, not that we're putting a law enforcement component onto the public, but as this whole community approach that we talk about, if somebody's too close to you at a park or, or not wearing a facial covering, which is recommended, we're, we're hoping that us New Jerseyans say, hey, you know, let's, we're trying to keep these parks and golf courses open. Let's all, let's all pull our weight and do our share. 
Amen. Thank you. Judy or Christine, anything on either social distancing, antibody tests, or any other topics? Um, I'm just going to start a little bit on testing, and then I'm going to let Dr. Tan talk about the utility of serology antibody testing. Uh, right now, our um, expanding testing, we will be doing the diagnostic uh, molecular test, the PCR uh, test, which is uh, either the saliva test or the uh, nasal uh, swab. The serology test, which is a blood test, I guess you do it through a prick of a finger, has some utility um, for certain things that you're looking for that the epidemiologists can speak better to. Right. And, and um, basically, the serology tests, um, the utility um, is that uh, for the individual is somewhat limited um, because Knowing whether or not a person has antibodies, um, has positive antibody tests, does not mean that you know whether the person might um, actually have immunity to the virus. Not all individuals um, can uh, necessarily generate antibodies, uh, so sometimes you might have people who might have been infected who might not generate the antibody response. Um, so in terms of you know the utility for the individual, as the World Health Organization has put it, the serology tests are not meant to be an immune passport. We don't know whether, you know, this is um, useful information for whether or not a person can return to work safely um, without the risk of possible reinfection, for example, or, or other um, aspects. Or a negative test doesn't necessarily mean that they might not have been exposed in the past. Um, we do think that the um, serology tests do have utility for potentially um, characterizing population um, burden. So, for example, you know, we're in, uh, we know that uh, many different jurisdictions throughout the country, in conjunction with the uh, Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and um, we in New Jersey are looking at seroprevalence surveys, where basically what we're doing is we're doing a snapshot of individuals um, who um, might have uh, been exposed and might have been infected in the past to kind of characterize that uh, you know the the scope of illnesses that we might not have captured with the acute cases of illnesses that we see that are captured through the diagnostic tests that the commissioner had mentioned. Brent, you get to close us out here. Hold on one sec. So New York, I know you mentioned schools a little bit, but I just wanted to ask a little more about it. Uh, New York is keeping schools closed now. Um, are, do you know any idea if you're leaning towards that or anything else you could say? Do we have a clue where these new cases are coming from? Like the, the, the few thousand that we're seeing, or, or, do we know if they're coming from uh, long-term care facilities or all from the south or? New positives, any, you mean? Yeah, new positives, yeah. Um, we're, we're hearing from hospitals, uh, especially in the central part of the state, that they still don't have enough PPE, especially gowns. Um, wondering if there's any update on that or, or, or who they could go to or whether they go to the federal government or to you to ask for that. And then uh, three, this is just a, or fourth, uh, this is just a, tennis courts, are they also going to be closed to parks? I didn't see anything in the order about that. So that was it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll start, and I think it sounds like um, Pat and or, and or Judy, nothing on schools. Good try, but nothing on schools you'll hear early week. Um, thank you for that. New positive cases. I was actually looking at this by county. Um, number one overnight, uh, Judy, is Passaic. Um, and Passaic is number four overall. I assume you mean geographically? I think it's yeah, it's geographically one. I'm sorry. Geographically one. And do we also have any clue, like, where they're actually coming from? Are these from nursing homes? Are they from people walking out about, I, I figured I'd ask. So I'll, t I'll give you the counties and then Judy can, can, can speculate. I'm not sure we do know that, but uh, number one is, uh, oh, this is just Lily on the overnight. Well, you've been listening to Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey give us an update on the changes within his state with coronavirus. We're going to take a short break. We're going to have more live news at the top of this hour with the latest headlines. Please stay with us. We hope you'll join us back. You're streaming CBSN. These are hard, tiring, taxing jobs, even before coronavirus came. This is my Clorox wipes, my Lysol. I have no idea what I'm walking into. I don't know if the customers are carriers. I feel privileged to be out here with so many people out of work. 
Did you ever think that you would find yourselves at the front line? We have the opportunity to bring something valuable to the community, and that feels good. We have to be willing to change policy on a permanent basis to recognize and honor these workers. It doesn't seem like it's worth the risk that you endure every day. I have to do what I can to take care of myself and my family. If you had the choice, would you stay home? Uh, maybe, yeah. Sinking. Devastating flooding has reached catastrophic levels. Rising sea levels are threatening America's coasts. You would have to take that house and put it on stilts 10 feet tall. If the street is filled with salt water, what difference does it make how high you make your house? The concentration of the highest rental rates is exactly where the elevation is highest. This was the evidence to prove that climate gentrification was real. Pay 1800 in five days or you have to leave. Are you scared? Yes. Every single person who stood up and said, I am not paying this rent increase, received an eviction. Patients built this place and you're getting kicked out. Yes. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You were donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. In times of uncertainty... Dr. Fauci, it does seem like so much of this, we're making it up as we go along. When you have more questions than answers... Does flattening mean that we'll soon see a decrease, or does it suggest there's a plateau? Well, that is a great question. There's one voice you can turn to for truth. We want to turn now to the important issue of mental health. Understanding. How do we socially distance without emotionally distancing ourselves? And making sense of our world. We are all in this together. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rena Ninen coming to you from my home studio. At least 33 states are easing their restrictions today after federal guidelines to slow the spread of the coronavirus expired overnight. For some states, that means loosening social distancing measures and reopening certain businesses, such as restaurants, even movie theaters. But other states are opting to extend stay-at-home orders. And that includes Michigan, where hundreds of people protested at the state capitol against the move. Carter Evans is in Huntington Beach, California, where the governor made the decision to close beaches after large crowds last weekend. The images we saw on a few of our beaches were disturbing. California Governor Gavin Newsom is cracking down, closing Orange County beaches over concerns that crowds last weekend were jeopardizing public health. When you pull back too quickly, you literally put people's lives at risk. But his order frustrated some Orange County residents. I'm going to come here anyway. What are they going to do? They're going to try and arrest me. And some local officials. Uh, were you surprised at the governor's announcement? I was a little surprised and quite disappointed. He's singling out Orange County. It's uncalled for. In Michigan, the Democratic governor extended the state's coronavirus emergency declaration by executive order Thursday night after the Republican-controlled legislature declined to do so. The worst thing we could do is to abandon all social distancing, to pretend like we are done with COVID-19 and resume life as it was. This after defiant protesters again demonstrated at the state's capital, demanding an end to the statewide stay at home order. At least six states recently extended their lockdown orders into May, but even more states have just relaxed their social distancing guidelines. That means businesses in some states are reopening with limits, potentially providing economic relief to some of the 30 million plus Americans that filed for unemployment in the last six weeks. 
In Texas, restaurants can begin dine-in services today, operating at 25% capacity. We just got to make sure whoever needs to work the most is working the most at the moment. Chuck Gannam owns two House of Pies restaurants in the Houston area and employs 130 people. He says while they're ecstatic to come back, they're also being flexible. We're all happy that we're going to be back together, you know, but we just have to take as many precautions to make sure that everybody stays healthy as much as possible. Well, today marks just over two months since the first reported death from COVID-19 in the United States. Since March, the number of reported cases in the U.S. has grown exponentially. The country reported 89 cases back then. That number now swelling to more than a million today. It's largely in part due to increased testing capabilities. The U.S. death toll now stands at over 63,000. Natalie Brand reports on how President Trump is lashing out at China for the outbreak. President Trump claims he's seen credible evidence that COVID-19 originated in a lab in Wuhan, China. What gives you a high degree of confidence that this originated from the Wuhan Institute of Virology? I can't tell you that. I'm not allowed to tell you that. The intelligence community released a statement saying the virus was not man-made or genetically modified, but says it is investigating whether it began through contact with infected animals or as a result of an accident at a lab in Wuhan. One of two things happened. They either didn't do it and, you know, they couldn't do it from a competent standpoint or they let it spread. And, uh, I, you know, I, I would say probably it was got, it got out of control. The president says he's considering more tariffs against China because of the coronavirus. China responded, saying the virus is the enemy, not China. Domestically, a battle is shaping up over financial relief for state and local governments devastated by the pandemic. Some Republicans are pushing back against what they call a blue state bailout. I don't know that we should be working with states that have been suffering for uh, through bad leadership or bad management for 25 years, and I'm, we're supposed to fix that. This isn't about any other budget issues for states. It's about the coronavirus outlays revenue lost. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says state and local governments could need a trillion dollars. This is to allow us to keep firefighters, teachers, police, EMS on the payroll, serving the communities in their hour of need. The Senate will debate the issue as lawmakers return to Washington on Monday, even though D.C.'s stay-at-home order has not been lifted. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. White House correspondent Ben Tracy joins me now. You know, Ben, the president is saying that this originated from a lab in Wuhan. We saw in your package that he said he can't provide the evidence of it. Then you've got the U.S. intelligence community saying that might not be the case. So where is the president getting this? That's unclear. Uh, the president said that he has seen credible evidence that it perhaps uh, came from this lab in Wuhan. But as you mentioned, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, their conclusion simply was that it was not man-made and it was not genetically engineered. But they very strongly said that they are still investigating its origins, whether it came from a lab in Wuhan or perhaps came from a wet market. Uh, the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, he has also said that we don't know the answer to this question. Uh, so the president uh, either has seen a piece of intelligence from somewhere other than the intelligence community that leads him to say that he has seen credible evidence, but nobody else is backing that up at this point. You know, Ben, it was back in February where the president was actually praising China's response to COVID-19. What happened? What's up with the turnaround all of a sudden? Yeah, there's been a pretty uh, sudden evolution in his thinking on China and coronavirus. You're right. Back in January, back in February, the president was praising, praising them for doing a good job. He even said they were being transparent. He specifically said that President Xi was doing a good job handling coronavirus. Now the pres president has changed that. Now he's saying, you know, the situation that we're in is largely because of China and the World Health Organization not sharing information when they knew it. That's the president's opinion on the matter. Uh, so th the president really has evolved on this. One interesting thing, though, is he still is not personally criticizing President Xi. When he's asked questions about, do you hold President Xi accountable for this, he really kind of dodges that and just uses China in general as his place where he's laying blame. Oh, that's an interesting differentiation. I want to ask you, though, Ben, for so long, the president's main campaign point for re-election has been a strong economy, and he's had strong footing on that. Now we've seen the economy take a different take. Is this part of a pivot to blame China? Is this part of a larger campaign strategy for the president? 
Well, I'll leave it to the political pundits to decide uh, if, if there's a link between the two. But there is no doubt that the campaign and President Trump are focusing a lot of their energy now on China. Uh, that should not be surprising. If you recall, the, when President Trump ran for president the first time, he focused on China. It was all about China ripping off the United States and how these trade deals were horrible and he was going to come in and fix it. Uh, you know, the president got that phase one trade deal back in January, and that's something he's very proud of. And he was hoping to have more of those trade deals before the election. That doesn't appear to be possible at this point now that we have this coronavirus and this war of words between China and the United States. But clearly the president is going to focus a lot of his time bashing China as he campaigns for re-election. And his campaign is very specifically trying to link Joe Biden with China, calling him Beijing Biden and saying that he's been soft mm. on China throughout his entire career and therefore the president is the better candidate because he is tougher on China. All right, and we'll have more on Joe Biden later this hour. But I want to thank you very much, Ben Tracy, for joining us from the White House. The Senate is scheduled to get back to work on Monday, but the Capitol doctor says there will not be enough coronavirus tests for all senators. According to Politico, the Capitol physician told senior Republican staff on a call that he would only have enough tests for those staffers and senators who are sick. He added that those test results would take two days or more to get back. About half of the senators are 65 or older, making them at an increased risk for COVID-19. Joe Biden is publicly denying sexual assault allegations brought by his former C Senate staffer, Tara Reid. A CBS News senior investigative correspondent, Catherine Herridge reports, many have been waiting for Biden to comment. No, it is not true. I'm saying unequivocally, it never, never happened. Responding to the sexual assault happened. claim, that he's been under increasing pressure to address, Joe Biden spoke out to MSNBC. Women have a right to be heard and the, and the press should rigorously investigate claims they make. I always uphold that principle. But in the end, in every case, the truth is what matters. And in this case, the truth is the claims are false. In 1993, Tara Reid worked in then Senator Joe Biden's office. She says a supervisor asked her to deliver Biden his gym bag and he assaulted her in a Capitol Hill hallway. I remember the coldness of the wall, and I remember his hands underneath my blouse and underneath my skirt, and his fingers penetrating me as he was kiss trying to kiss me. Reed's allegations have expanded over time. Last year, she told a Northern California newspaper that Biden, quote, used to put his hand on my shoulder and run his finger up my neck. I would just kind of freeze. However, she didn't tell reporters about the alleged assault until this March. Reid, a self-described lifelong Democrat, says she did speak with her supervisors in Senator Biden's office at the time about alleged sexual harassment from the senator and then faced retaliation. It shattered my life and changed the trajectory of my whole career in life. And I lost my job after I complained and I was fired. But two former Biden Senate staffers reclaimed she spoke to told us they had no recollection of any complaint. If there are records, Biden said they would be in the National Archives. I'm asking the Secretary of the Senate today to identify whether any such document exists. If it does, make it public. Reid has spoken to CBS News multiple times in the past month. And on Wednesday, CBS formally requested an on-camera interview. I want to bring in Anton C. Wright. He joins us now. He's a CBS News political contributor, Democratic strategist, and also senior advisor to the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. So, Antoine, Biden's public... We want to take you to the White House, where White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany is conducting her first press conference. Let's listen in. ...dollars in provider relief fund payments to 395 hospitals across the country that have been hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. These hospitals have collectively cared for over 70 percent of the 184,000 Americans that required hospital inpatient care. $10 billion of the $12 billion will go towards hospitals treating 100 or more COVID-19 admissions. HHS is distributing an additional $2 billion to these 395 hospitals in proportion to the amount of care they provide to low-income and uninsured patients. This is consistent with our effort to ensure that Americans who need federal government assistance the most receive it. We'll be releasing a breakdown of the states receiving this funding and the counties receiving this funding before your awareness. New York, New Jersey, and Illinois received the most funding by state. 
While New York, New York, Bronx, New York, and Cook, Illinois receive the most funding by county as determined by our metrics. Our healthcare providers, as President Trump has repeatedly acknowledged, are our heroes as we work to defeat the invisible enemy. This relief funding will help these heroes defeat this virus. In reacting to CARES relief, I love what this one provider said. So he said, thank you, and God, thank you and God for this relief. I have tears in my eyes out of gratitude for these funds. Thank you so, so, so much. Additionally, 100 flights as part of Project Airbridge have been completed to date. These flights have expedited nearly 1 billion pieces of PPE for our healthcare heroes. The third phase of coronavirus relief also included $320 billion in additional funding for the Paycheck Protection Program, which, as you all know, provides forgivable loans to small businesses in order to keep their employees on payroll. This program has been extraordinarily successful. During the first round of PPP loans, 1.6 million loans were issued to small businesses. Of those 1.6 million loans, 1 million of them were given to companies with 10 or fewer employees. So it has gone to small businesses uh, and businesses that need it most. But the PPP, look, it's not just another government program. This is supporting everyday Americans who, through no fault of their own, have found themselves in this predicament. We saw this firsthand at the White House on Tuesday. On Tuesday, President Trump welcomed small business owners and employees to the White House. These small businesses received PPP loans, which helped them pay their employees during the pandemic. Biddy and Bose was among the small businesses welcomed to the White House. Biddy and Bose employs 120 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's a coffee shop not too far away from here. Biddy and Bose had to temporarily close its doors, but because of PPP loans, Biddy and Bose was able to rehire all of its employees. Um, I had the real honor of getting to meet Michael Hoyp. Um, he's one of the employees at Biddy's and Biddy and Bose, and he offered some words of encouragement to our country, um, and they really touched my heart, and I think they'll touch the heart of, the, of America, if you guys wouldn't mind playing those remarks. You, President Trump and Ivanka, thanks a lot for inviting us. Thank you, Mr. President, for having us. I love my job, and I am excited about going back to work. At Being Bowls, we like to use the phrase called not broken. That means me and all my amazing coworkers are not broken, and we have lots to offer. I know the great country of the United States isn't broken either. So on behalf of myself, Megan, and Amy, and all the employees of Bean Balls, thank you for inviting us over. You guys are our family. Michael's an incredible young man. I gave him a call yesterday and asked him what he was up to, and he said he and his fellow employees were literally handwriting notes uh, to put in uh, with their coffee packages that they send out to consumers. Um, I received one of these notes from another company, and it really does put a smile on your face. And Michael's doing that each and every day. And Biddy and Bose, they represent the hope and opportunity that is on the horizon for America's workers as their body, their, their business rather, embodies the American spirit. Workers like Michael show that this country is not broken and that we will recover together. Michael, thank you. You're an American hero. Thank you for sharing that message of hope. And with that, I'll take questions. John. Kelly, if I could, welcome to the podium for the first time. Thank you. As well. Uh, the markets are down su substantially today after the president yesterday suggested in the East Room that he might use tariffs to punish China over the coronavirus. Is, is there any serious consideration being given to putting new tariffs on China, or, or was the president just spitballing yesterday? Look, I won't get ahead of any announcements from the president, but I will echo the president's displeasure with China. Uh, it's no secret that China mishandled this situation. Just a few examples for you. They did not share the genetic sequence until a professor in Shanghai did so on his own the very next day. China shut down his lab for, quote, rectification. Uh, they slow walked information on human to human transmission alongside the World Health Organization and didn't let U.S. investigators in at a very important time. So uh, we take displeasure with China's actions, but I certainly won't get ahead of the president with those announcements. Is, is the president seriously considering forcing China to pay some sort of compensation, reparations, what, whatever word you want to put on it. Again, when it comes to retaliatory measures, um, I will not get ahead of the president on that. Thank you, Kaylee, and welcome to the podium as well. 
Uh, the president said yesterday that he has a high degree of confidence that the coronavirus originated in a lab in Wuhan, China, and yet his own <clears throat> intelligence agencies say they're still investigating. So uh, does the president have information, and has he drawn a conclusion that the intelligence community has not yet? Well, the president's statement is consistent with the other intelligence assessments. While we continue to have very limited and dubious data from China, current assessments indicated that President Trump's statement is consistent with what some anim analysts believe is the epicenter of where the virus began. And I would note that intelligence statement you're referring to really made two points. One, that this virus originated in China. Uh, two, that it began through contact with infected animals or was the result of an accident at a laboratory in Wuhan. Uh, so I consider that consistent with what the president said, that he's seen intelligence suggesting it could be in the Wuhan laboratory. It yes. seemed to lean into the idea that this started in a laboratory, whereas the statement that we saw from the DNI said, we're still investigating those two options that you just laid out. Is the president in any way uh, creating mixed messaging by not saying, we're still investigating? No, you know, let me remind everyone, intelligence is just an estimate, essentially, and it's up to policymakers to decide what to do with that intelligence. This, in this case, the policymaker is the president of the United States, and he'll make that decision at the right time. Is the president any close to uh, deciding what to do about China? Has, has he received any recommendations uh, of the consequences? Is he anywhere near a decision? Look, again, I won't get ahead of the president's decision or the timing of that decision, but he takes this very seriously because the decisions of China that I referenced, um, slow walking some of that information, put American lives at risk. And rest assured, this president has one priority, and that is the safety and the well being of American lives. Thanks so much, Kaylee. Welcome. Um, since it's been more than 100 days since the press secretary stood up there, I um, wanted to get a better sense of what your plan is. Are you planning to do these in, on a daily basis at this point? And also, um, will you pledge never to lie to us from that podium? I will never lie to you. You have my word on that. As to the timing of the briefings, um, we do plan to do them. Um, I will announce timing of that forthcoming, but we do plan to continue these. John. Uh, welcome to the to the podium. Uh, a question for you on Project Warp, Warp Speed. Can you give us some more details? Uh, the president said ultimately he's in charge of this project, but will there be a day-to-day -day point person on this? What's the budget for this project, and when uh, can the American people realistically expect that there will be a, a, a vaccine available to everybody? Well, there is a day-to-day -day point person, and that's the President of the United States, President Trump. Um, and with regard to vaccines, I would note um, the words of Dr. Fauci, which are these, going into a phase of one trial within three months of getting the sequence is unquestionable, the world indoor record. Uh, nothing has ever gone this fast. So what the President is doing and under the President's leadership, uh, we're in phase one faster than ever before, according to Dr. Fauci, and that should encourage the American people. In the budget, in the budget, and then there's really no other point person? I mean, I know the president ultimately, I guess the buck stops with the president, but he hasn't put a, somebody on the on the staff. I'm not, uh, yeah, to, I'm not going to get into any details as to exactly how that works, but just rest assured we're on an accelerated pace to a vaccine, at least for this phase one portion of clinical trial. Budget, yes. budget. Um, thanks. The, the Fed yesterday took an action that appeared designed to allow oil companies to access their lending facilities. So I'm wondering if the President has spoken to Chairman Powell about this, uh, if he's happy about the move, uh, and if the White House is considering any additional assistance to the oil companies. So I won't get into um, the President's personal discussions, but I would just note um, that the President um, is always looking out for the nearly 11 million American workers in the oil industry. Um, I would also note that we're filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve right now, um, and we'll buy 75 million barrels. So that's the only announcements I have on the oil front today. Yes, Talu. Uh, thank you, Kaylee. Um, the President tweeted this morning about the protests in Michigan. Uh, he essentially said that the governor of Michigan should work with the protesters. She called them very good people and said that they are very angry. Uh, some of those protests I'm sure you saw included, you know, heavily armed protesters, members of militia groups. I wonder if the president was speaking about those uh, specific members who uh, stormed the Capitol in Michigan when he talked about very good people. Look, the president was referencing generally that in this country you have a First Amendment right uh, to protest. I think that's something we all treasure here. Um, and we should, rightfully. You have a right to do that constitutionally, but you must protest within the bounds of the law. Um, he encourages everyone to protest lawfully, um, and also to engage in our social distancing guidelines, which we think all Americans should engage in. 
Do you have any response to just the imagery of you know people with long guns essentially storming the Capitol, going into face-offs with police officers, and intimidating in some way some of the lawmakers? Again, the president says you know that we must protest lawfully and act within the bounds of the law. Yes. Thank you for being here. Uh, when the president says we did a spectacular job, but when Jared Kushner talks about a great success story, some Americans see it as a lack of empathy. What's uh, you understand their reaction? Look, you know, Jared Kushner um, has, first of all, done a great job for this administration. And what I would say to that is um, that his, when he talked about a success story, he was talking about the story of this administration, which is a story of mobilization for the American people, the greatest mobilization of American industry since World War II. Um, of course, we grieve for every American life that has been lost. Um, but we want the American people to be confident in the response of this administration. And that is what he was referring to. The fact that in the average year, the healthcare industry uses 25 million N95 masks, and we have delivered in this short time 75 million N95 masks, more than three times what the healthcare sector uses in a year. That's extraordinary. It's extraordinary that you know some in the media were saying that we needed a million ventilators, and uh, this president has. We haven't. We've needed far short of that so far. Not not a single American has died for lack of a ventilator. And the fact that this president can look the American people in the eye and say, I. I am producing 100,000 ventilators this year alongside the private sector. Um, 100,000 ventilators, that's three times what we produce in the average year. I'd consider that a great success on behalf of the American people. I guess it's more about the tone than the, the, the policy itself. We want to give the American people confidence that they have a federal government that is doing everything in our power to provide the necessary equipment to, to combat this invisible enemy. Um, we grieve for the American lives. We've said that repeatedly. I, I will echo that today. My heart breaks for those. I pray regularly for those who are affected by the coronavirus. Uh, but we're going to give confidence to the American people that you have a federal government under President Donald Trump that's going to step up and give the greatest mobilization of the private sector since World War II. Yes. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Thanks for being here. Uh, President Trump mentioned the situation in Brazil a few times this week. Besides talks of cutting off flights from Brazil, are there talks of, uh, in terms of sending uh, assistance to Brazil, sending PPE or ventilators to Brazil? And is President Trump planning to talk with President Bolsonaro? Well, the president has mentioned that he has sent ventilators um, around the world. Any excess supply, we certainly look to help other countries. Um, but, you know, in terms of a specific announcement regarding Brazil, I don't have any new information for you on that front today. Yeah, Kelly, um, welcome. One of the most important parts of your job, though, is to have access to the president. Can you give us some indication that since you've been named press secretary, what kind of access do you have to the president to get what he's thinking and relay it to us? Yeah, I can tell you this. I'm around the president almost the entire day. I was just with him before I left to come out and speak with you guys. I think my staff can attest to the fact that they have a very hard time finding me because I'm normally with the president in the Oval Office. Um, so I'm, I'm consistently with him, absorbing his thinking. And it's my mission uh, to bring you the mindset of the president, deliver those facts so this president gets fair and accurate reporting and the American people get fair and accurate information. Yeah. Thanks, Kaylee. Just following up on Kristen's question, China's blocking the World Health Organization from coming in and investigating how this started. Shouldn't external investigators be allowed into Wuhan to determine, one, how the pandemic started, and two, maybe a way that we could expedite finding a cure for this thing? Look, you know, there's no secret that China stopped U.S. investigators from coming in. Um, it was of paramount importance that we got into China um, in an expedited fashion, and, and that didn't happen. Um, with respect to the World Health Organization, they have some questions of their own to answer. Uh, the United States, as the president has emphasized, provides about $400 million to $500 million per year to the WHO, compared to China at roughly $40 million a year. But yet, the WHO appears to have a very clear China bias. I mean, you look at this timeline, and it's really really damning for the WHO when you consider the fact that on December 31st, you had uh, Taiwanese officials warning about human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, the WHO did not make that public. On January 9th, the WHO repeated China's claim that the virus, quote, does not transmit readily between people. That was quite apparently false. Uh, on January 14th, the WHO again repeated China's talking points about no human-to-human -human transmission. Uh, they praised China's leadership on the 22nd of January, on the 23rd. They said, and this is incredible, the pandemic didn't represent a public health emergency of international concern. And even on February 29th, you had the WHO saying that when the coronavirus was spreading around the world, uh, they 
they chose to put, put, excuse me, political correctness first by opposing life-saving travel restrictions. The travel restrictions this president put in place, the travel restrictions that Dr. Fauci praised as saving lives. And you have the World Health Organization opposing a measure that saved American lives. That's unacceptable, especially at a time when the U.S. was providing 400 to $500 million. John. Kaylee, this time last week, the president was saying that he was not happy with Georgia's Governor Brian Kemp for beginning the reopening process in the way that he was at the time that he was. A week later, uh, there have been some peaks and valleys in new cases in Georgia, but overall, the trend line is down. Uh, do you know what the president's thinking about the Georgia reopening is as of today? Look, the president, the president is resolute in saying that the states take the lead here. Um, it's the the lead, the decision of governors to decide what is best for their state. That being said, um, you know, I've, I talked to the experts, I, I talked to Dr. Burks, I talked to Dr. Fauci, and they say, rightfully so, this president has always sided on the side of data, which is why he encourages all states to follow the data-driven guidelines to reopening. Um, all states from Georgia um, on down the line should follow those guidelines, but ultimately, it is the decision of the states. And one note I would make about the president, in times of national emergency, we seem to have had a trend in this country where uh, presidents aggregate power at the federal level, um, but this president has devolved power. He's invested in a principle that I cherish, and I know many others do, which is federalism, and I think that was the right decision. Has, has he yeah. mentioned how he feels about Governor Kemp in the last few days? I have not spoken to him about Governor Kemp in the last few days. As the pres on the lines of reopening, as the president pushes forward to reopen the country, does that mean he'll be campaigning in those uh, states? where he w that will be reopening so i would refer you to the trump campaign on, on that question yeah yeah thanks for being here kaylee um you mentioned dr fauci a minute ago are we going to have any more press briefings with dr fauci and dr burks and the health experts or is the white house kind of shifting the message to you know focus more on the economy and less on the public health aspect well, let me back up and talk to you a little bit about how we approach disseminating information. You know, when I talk with my colleague Alyssa and we plan out the communicate communication strategy for this White House along with the President um, and Ben as well. You know, what we do is we say, what is the best mode for the public to receive this information at this time? And we allow the news cycle and the needs of the American people to guide us. And, you know, at the moment, what we see happening, and I hinted at this in my gaggle last week, is uh, you have 35 states and probably more at this point with plans to reopen the country. Americans are looking to reopening the country. We've had Dr. Burks in several events this week. They've been Dr. Burks and Fauci out on the airwaves. Um, they're really incredible people and have done a great service for this country, but we allow the uh, news of the day to guide us, what the American people um, need to hear. And right now we're in a reopening phase, which is why you've seen the president this week with CEOs. You've seen him with small business owners, with small business employees, today with some great heroes um, that have emerged from this pandemic and have done a lot of the hard work. So every day we approach this as how can we disseminate this information? Uh, there's a need for information, which is why I'm here supplementing the, the efforts of this president to get the message out. I would also note he's the most successful president in history, took questions twice yesterday, twice the day before. You hear from him quite often, as well uh, as well as our medical experts. So is the task force still meeting? I guess, what, what's the role of the coronavirus yes, the, task force? We still have, you know, hundreds of people a day are dying. So does, what, what, what role does the task force have versus the economic advisory groups? Yeah, the, the task force meets regularly. I go to those meetings. Um, I hear them. We are, Dr. Burks, I should say, is um, meticulously reviewing the data in granular detail. Um, I watch them spend sometimes the upwards of two hours in these task force um, briefings. So those are, those are still ongoing, um, rest assured. We want a safe reopening. Uh, so we are prioritizing the health of the American people, um, as well as looking forward to reopening this country. Yes, thank you, Kaylee. Back to the DNI uh, statement from yesterday, there is a quote that I'd like to, you to, give, to give me a response to. It said, the intelligence community also concurs with the wide scientific consensus that the COVID-19 virus was not man-made or genetically modified. Uh, this was from the DNI statement. How do you uh, see this uh, uh, statement? How do you understand this? And also there was a piece in the New York Times uh, that said senior uh, Trump administration officials have pushed intelligence agencies to hunt for evidence to support the theory that COVID-19 was uh, made in a Wuhan uh, laboratory. 
I can assure you that no one is um, pressing the intelligence community to come to a determination. Uh, the intelligence community statement stands. Um, it's in perfect concert with what the president said. Um, so, you know, I encourage the media to convey the facts to the American people, which is um, that we're in line as an administration and we stand by the intelligence community, and that is com in complete concert with, the, with what the president said yesterday. Um, who haven't I gone to? Oh, I've gone to almost everyone. Okay, so we're in round two. That's great. Yes. Thank you. Today, former Vice President Joe Biden denied allegations of sexual misconduct against him. Does President Trump take him at his word, given that, as the president has said, he has denied allegations against himself? Well, what I would say is that we are pleased that the former vice president has decided to go on the record. It took him less than, what, 16 hours to follow the advice of the president of the United States and come out and publicly address those claims. So, you know, we're glad to see that he's on the record Let on this. Let me ask you about something the president said moments ago in an interview. He said that Tara Reid is, quote, far more compelling than anything they had with respect to Brett Kavanaugh. What did he mean by that? What is more compelling? You know, that's the president's assessment, so I would point you back to his words. I think it was a grave miscarriage of justice, what happened with Justice Brett Kavanaugh. Um, I, there's no need for me to bring up some of the salacious, awful, and verifiably false allegations that were made against Justice Kavanaugh. Um, that was an embarrassment for the Democrat Party to have dragged the name of a very respectable man through the mud like that. Um, so I, I'll leave it at that. Yes. Uh, Kelly, as the radio pooler, I'm asking this on behalf of our colleague. There's word the decision to release Michael Cohen from prison to home confinement due to COVID-19 has been reversed. Did the White House directly or indirectly intervene here? Um, no. So absolutely not, I would say there. But I am glad that um, you brought up justice and because, look, there's, again, uh, a, a case of injustice that is yet to be brought up today, but I certainly would like to bring it up. And that's the case of General Michael Flynn. Um, what we've all learned from that should scare every American citizen. Uh, the fact that you had Jim Comey um, admitting in December of last year uh, that he violated a protocol by directing agents to confront Flynn, something that he would not quote, have gotten away with under previous administrations. Uh, the FBI told Flynn he didn't need a lawyer when they came to meet with him. Uh, McCabe told FBI agents that he didn't think Flynn was lying. And then all of that information we've learned um, over the last few months and years culminates in the fact that we have a handwritten FBI note that says, quote, we need to get Flynn to lie, quote, and get him fired. Um, that was there was an unfair, unfair target on the back of General Michael Flynn. Um, it should concern every American any time uh, there's a partisan uh, pursuit of an individual, and that's certainly at least those questions are raised with regard to General Michael Flynn, an honorable man yeah. who served his country. Yeah. John, yeah, Kelly, uh, on that, when the president fired Michael Flynn. Uh, he said he was doing so because he had lied to the vice president and he had lied to the FBI. So given all that you've just said, isn't it, all, isn't it still true? Doesn't the president still believe that Michael Flynn lied to Vice President Pence and lied to the FBI? Well, first, let me address that. Vice President Pence is on the record about this. He said um, he's inclined to believe that Flynn did not intentionally mislead him. And I guess I would turn the question on you and just ask, does it trouble you that the FBI said uh, we got to get Flynn to lie? Doesn't that trouble you as a journalist? And well, not, not only that, as an American citizen. Well, it's certainly something worth reporting. It's not my Absolutely. job to say whether or not it's troubling. But, but, but the bottom line is the president said point blank that Flynn lied to the FBI and to the vice president. And I'm just asking a very direct question. Does he still believe that Michael Flynn lied to the FBI and lied to the vice president? And again, I'd point you to the vice president's statement that he's inclined to believe that Flynn did not intentionally mislead him. Um, and I'm asking back that all of you in your coverage endeavor to report what is a very scary story when the FBI is saying, let us get someone to lie. I've seen very scant coverage of that. It's a story worth reporting and a story that I hope the American people, if you haven't heard it yet, are getting to hear for the very first time. Chanel? Thank you, Secretary Going back to the South China Sea, the South China Sea, we had an issue come up this morning where you had the USS Barry crossing international maritime waters. And then China, it, this is in the South China Sea. And Chinese officials are saying that this will be a dead end endeavor. Does, has the president spoken with uh, any of the, any side on the Chinese uh, as far as 
what the United States is going to continue doing? Is the U.S. Navy going to just ignore these threats and keep keep going through these international waters? What are your responses to China's increasing aggression in the South China Sea again? Yeah, I have no news to report as to the President's conversations. And for the specifics of that, I would um, redirect you to the NSC. Yes. Thanks. Um, in the same podcast interview, the President said that uh, Democrats would, quote, have to give us a lot for aid to, to states. I'm wondering if you have any idea of what specifically the White House or the President is asking for. And uh, secondly, what you'd say to somebody like Governor Cuomo, who says, you know, the President's already told me, uh, you know, a few weeks ago that he would support this type of assistance. And why are we bailing out, um, you know, airlines or defense contractors, but not the states that play, that pay teachers or first responders? Well, first, you brought up Governor Cuomo, so I just um, thought it's a good time to remind everyone that Governor Cuomo has praised the president's response um, in this COVID-19 crisis, saying that what the president has achieved is a phenomenal accomplishment. And we thank Governor Cuomo um, for those very kind words. But on that note, with regard to funding to states, um, phase four is something that uh, we want to start negotiating, negotiating on immediately um, and get to work on. Um, um, the president has said, look, I will certainly um, look to uh, consider helping states who have coronavirus reasons for um, the financial situation they find themselves in, but he doesn't want this to be an excuse for decades and decades of bad Democrat governance that have run um, some of these states into a, a financial predicament. So he has mentioned that um, in terms of the types of things he wants to see in this phase four. I don't want to get ahead of the, ne the negotiations, but I do want to emphasize that he has mentioned sanctuary cities. Um, this is a really important issue that has cost American lives. Um, last year, a brave ICE officers arrested more than 120,000 criminal aliens charged with nearly 10,000 burglaries, 5,000 sexual assaults, 45,000 violent assaults, 2,000 murders, and in the last year, egregiously, 5,000 human trafficking episodes. So American lives matter. Our brave ICE men and women matter. And it's something that he's mentioned he'd like to see in a phase four. I mean, you raised that. And the president's been kind of vague about this. Are you explicitly conditioning state aid on uh, states or, or cities not saying that they would have sanctuary city policies? No, I'm not. No, the, not conditioning anything, but saying that is a negotiation item that the, that the president will certainly uh, bring up. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, so the president uh, has in the past denied any of the allegations from the many women who have accused him of sexual misconduct. Um, but for that, that podcast today, you seem to suggest the allegations that Tara Reid has raised are, are more, what do you say, credible than the ones uh, against Brett Kavanaugh. Um, what about the allegations that were raised against him, however? Why should the public, um, or what makes them, them any less credible? than the allegations from Tara Reid. The president has uh, swiftly denied all of these allegations that were raised four years ago. Um, he has always told the truth on these issues. Um, he's denied them immediately. And you're bringing up issues, like I said, from four years ago that were asked and answered. And the American people had their say in the matter when they elected President Trump as president of the United States. But you know, the media, leave it to the media to really take an issue about the former vice president and turn it on the president and bring up accusations from four years ago that were asked and answered in the form of the vote of the American people. Just come back, Kelly, uh, to John's question, because Kellyanne Conway spoke to, to this the other day and suggested that two things could be true at the same time. We now have the vice president saying it's his belief that General Flynn may have unintentionally misled him. That's now three years after the fact. But the two things that could have been true at the same time were, were that Flynn lied to the vice president and also lied to the FBI. If you remove the FBI piece of that, would the president still have fired Michael Flynn for his belief that he lied at that point to the vice president? I mean, I'm not going to engage in a hypothetical, and that's essentially um, what that would be. But what I would say is echo yet again uh, that this was a grave miscarriage of justice. Um, I am very glad that the FBI thought to keep a paper trail, because what many have said for a very long time, pointing to the first few facts I shared with you culminating in that handwritten note, um, I'm glad they kept such good documentation of their intent to slow walk General Flynn um, into a trap and to essentially um, create, as I mentioned, a grave miscarriage of justice. So um, FBI, at least we can thank you for the great note taking. Let me follow up on that, though. John does bring up the point that General Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. I'm not going to get involved in uh, what was a, a, a matter of justice. Though, it's, in a sense. Do you not consider it a miscarriage of justice when you have the FBI writing, we want to get someone to lie? Is that 
a miscarriage of justice. But in, in the end, he pleaded guilty, and then that's... You hesitated, because you know what the answer uh, is. The answer is yes. That's a lot of other people to And decide, I would encourage so. the media to cover it, because I've watched a lot of your networks. I've read a lot of your papers. I've seen a whole lot of scant information about Michael Flynn, uh, when there was a whole lot of speculation about Russia, 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 culminating in $40 million of taxpayer uh, money being lost in the complete and total exoneration of President Trump. Thank you guys so much. I'm going to cut this short now and go see my little five-month-old here in a few hours. And let me just say this. Um, the President at 5 p.m. leaves today for Camp David. It's going to be working weekend. He'll be talking with heads of states, um, with elected officials. We have a great event coming up this afternoon. And, of course, um, everyone should watch the Fox News Town Hall with the President from 7 to 9 p.m. It'll be a uh, can't-miss television, much like the highly rated President Trump uh, coronavirus task force course briefings have been. Thank you. That was White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany briefing reporters. It's the first White House Press Secretary briefing reporters in over a year. March 2019 was the last one. Well, we're going to take a short break. We've got a lot of other news to catch you up on. Stick with us. You're streaming CBS at. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. Now, we need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Rose Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. You got to help each other out no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. As many schools remain closed, parents are trying to fill in the gaps in their children's education. Meg Oliver spoke to some stressed out parents trying to keep their kids focused. It seems like the world's caving in on you. Yeah. Allison Ferrante is overwhelmed trying to balance it all. When you look at your kids' to-do list, is that enough just to make you break down? Yes. <laughs> and it's crazy because they're kindergarten and second grade. Ferrante is a seventh grade math teacher in Queens, New York, an area hit hard by the virus. She worries about her students beyond their education. Her husband is an emergency room physician assistant, adding another layer of stress to the family dynamic. With all of that going on, where does education fall in your, in your priority list? It's high up there because it does give you something to focus on, but there just needs to be a little less. Work never stops. Work never stops. It is around the clock. Anisha Warner is an eighth grade teacher in New York City and a single mom to her six-year-old son. I am everything. I am his support system. I am his lunch lady. I am his... I'm his teacher. I'm his best friend right now. Warner said on days when her job is more demanding, she needs to scale back her son's work. I can't even imagine a parent who is not a teacher at all getting all of these materials. Currently, schools in 36 states and the District of Columbia have been ordered to remain closed the rest of the academic year. That's around 33 million public school students. 
Students like Lanetta Wilson's three young children in Fort Worth, Texas. They've been remote learning since mid-March. I feel like in the beginning, I wanted to be a perfect parent, you know, and I quickly realized, you know what, we're all learning. Wilson said at first, balancing her job as a social worker with her children's education was incredibly difficult. After she came up with a daily schedule, the routine started to gel. What are you more concerned about, their education or their mental health? I'm going to do my part also to make sure that they're where they need to be ac academically, but you can't, you can't put a price and an importance on their mental health. School psychologist Brandon Gamble agrees. He said the most important thing right now for families is just taking time to be together. Prioritize your wellness because if you're not well, then it's difficult for your children to be well. So take that time, right? Like, like they say on the airplane, um, get that oxygen mask for yourself first. I basically just leave my computer on all day. Ferrante says exercise reduces her stress, but that can only go so far. When I do call parents of my own students, like I really tell them I, I understand what they're going through and it must be even harder. Can you keep up this pace? I know I can get through the rest of the school year. I hope we have our summer at least to recuperate. Some school districts are now sending out surveys like this one that my children's school sent, trying to get a pulse on how parents are coping. My favorite question on here, what are we grateful for? Something psychologists say we have to keep asking ourselves. Meg Oliver, CBS News, Montclair, New Jersey. Well, it is May 1st, and for some high school seniors heading to college in the fall, it's actually the deadline to send in those deposits to attend the university of their choice. One factor, usually not in the education, the coronavirus pandemic and the effect that it has on whether students will actually be able to enroll. Well, since 2011, long before COVID-19 hit, university enrollment has dropped 11%. In 2019 alone, there were 250,000 fewer students than the previous fall. Many cite high tuition costs and mounting debt. As Axios's Erica Pandy reports, the uncertainty around enrollment is putting a heavy financial strain on colleges, particularly during the pandemic. Many are enacting hiring freezes, they're cutting costs, and some, like the University of Michigan, are projecting losses up to a billion dollars. Erica Pandy joins me now. She's a business reporter for Axios. Erica, thank you so much for joining us. Boy, this is supposed to be such an exciting time for kids and the parents of seniors as well, but you spoke to some of these students. How exactly are they planning for this fall? And how does the pandemic fit in sort of the larger trend that we were seeing in enrollment declines? I mean, just like we've been talking about every aspect of this pandemic, it's such a case-by-case -case thing for every student. You've got, I mean, I've, I've talked to students who are planning to major in the visual performing arts, and they're thinking if it's going to be online classes in the fall, I just want to take a year off. There are other students who have been deciding between the low, lower cost local university or a higher cost private university in a different state. And now, you know, they're, they're thinking differently and they're thinking maybe I should be closer to home in the middle of a public health crisis and, and spend less money if it's going to be all online classes. And, you know, all, all of this uncertainty is definitely adding to this, this greater trend of, as you said, enrollment declining at universities. It's really a problem for a lot of colleges because we were already in this debate of is college really worth the cost? And this couldn't be coming at a worse time for America's universities. You know, many public universities rely on athletic and, and state government funding. How dependent will these schools be on enrollment if they can't get the money from these alternative sources that they usually rely on? The pandemic is making America's already tuition sensitive and enrollment dependent universities even more so. So, I mean, Tuition revenue is hugely important when all of that on-campus revenue could be cut out, that athletic revenue could be cut out, room and board could be cut out. So now, I mean, as recently as last week, you saw colleges saying online classes in the fall could be likely. This past week, you're seeing more and more universities, big ones come out and say, it seems like a fall on campus is a necessity and here's how we're gonna make that happen. So you've got some really large universities, North Carolina, Texas, for instance, that are planning to reopen in the fall. What do many schools believe the fall semester will look like, especially with this reality of e-distance learning? So, you know, you've got, like you said, you've got colleges, big ones like Purdue, like the University of Nebraska, even uh, the president of Brown did an op-ed in the New York Times recently saying a physically open fall is something that we're trying to do, we're striving for. 
the reality is that many college presidents just don't know what's going to happen. And if you think two months ago on March 1st, we couldn't have seen what's coming. Two months later is going to be a totally different story. But they are starting to think about certain measures. One could be inviting only the freshmen back to campus, you know, as, as the most critical group that needs that on-campus orientation. Another could be spreading folks out, trying to get people to quarantine once they arrive on campus, you know, forbidding students from too much socialization, keeping them in tighter groups. But, you know, it's very hard to get college students to listen to you and, and, and say, you know, come to college, welcome to your freshman year, don't go to any parties. So it's a very, very tough thing to do. No, it's, it, I just don't know how you socially distance. I just think in my time in college, it's so hard, whether it's the library, going to the gym, hanging out, going to, uh, we know whatever, it's really tough. But I'm curious, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but what would you say could be the lasting financial impact, both for private and public universities as a result of COVID-19? There are a lot of colleges that, frankly and bluntly, if they don't open in the fall, they're going to have to close their doors in the next couple of years. So I think colleges are gonna do everything they can to avoid that. But you, this crisis is definitely going to see the acceleration of a lot of colleges going over that financial cliff. And you, you'll see colleges close. I think that's why they're going to be pushing on testing, they're gonna be pushing on tracing and figure out some way, however that is, to open their doors. And, and, and like you said, we're all kind of watching these universities and thinking, how are you possibly gonna do that? But I think some of them are gonna to try to pull it off. Erica Pandy with Axios. Thank you, Erica, for joining us. Thanks so much. Human trials for coronavirus vaccine are underway in Britain after a group of scientists at Oxford University discovered what they believe could be a cure for the deadly virus. CBS News foreign correspondent Intias Tayeb has more. Hi, Rena. Well, as the human trials of the promising Oxford University coronavirus vaccine continues to move at warp speed, so too does the race to produce and distribute it on a mass scale. A pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca announced on Thursday that it struck a deal with the Oxford Vaccine Group to do just that. The British drug maker CEO wouldn't say when production would start, but he did say that we'd have a good idea of the vaccine's efficacy by June or July. Whatever the case, AstraZeneca joins the Serum Institute of India, one of the world's largest vaccine manufacturers for its experimental COVID-19 vaccine way before it's even been approved by regulators. Now, Serum CEO says his company's plan is to make up to 60 million doses by as early as September. And if all goes well, 400 million more by early next year. Now, early trials of the Oxford vaccine has already seen success in monkeys, signaling the promising potential in humans around the world. At least 70 coronavirus vaccines are in development, including at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in partnership with Flugen. Now, Indian vaccine manufacturer Bharat Biotech has agreed to produce up to 300 million doses of that experimental vaccine. CEO Dr. Krishna Ella told CBS News he understood the risks in producing a vaccine still not approved by regulators, but said the company is less interested in the health of the company and more interested in the health of people. Rena. MTS, thank you very much. MTS Tayeb in London. Well, with stay-at-home orders still in effect, uh, across many states and cities in the U.S., it's been hard for some restaurants to stay open. But when a number of restaurant owners have come together, they've decided to try and figure out a way to keep their businesses afloat. Joy Benedict explains. Bakery near Los Angeles doesn't look much like a tapas wine bar these days. The restaurant tried to convert to a takeout business. It just wasn't enough to sustain us. So Robert Cronfully and his partner shut down and reopened as a local grocery store. We had the eggs by the 15, uh, milk, bacon. Using the food they already had. Flour will open up a 50 pound bag and repack it into five pound bags. I just think it's what the neighborhood needs more than our regular menu. It's a trend cooking all over the country. This place wasn't supposed to be a, a grocery store. At Chef Jeff's in Washington, D.C., Jeff Tracy, the husband of CBS Evening News anchor Nora O'Donnell, turned his dining room into a market. But food isn't his number one seller. Gloves, toilet paper, and bleach are number one. He's also offering takeout, but still had to let 200 employees go. We had 9-11 
hit right around here, the financial crisis, and in none of those situations did I ever have to lay off a, a single person. He's using any money made through his market to give to his workers. But it's not only locally owned restaurants that are turning into grocery stores. The national chain Panera is now selling fresh produce and dairy products for pickup or delivery at 1,800 locations. When olive oil. And Landry's owned restaurants across the country are doing the same, including at the Gandhi Dancer in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're selling six lemons for $2. You know, so that those are better than grocery store prices. The high-end seafood restaurant is also selling sea bass and lobster tails. The elderly people are extremely appreciative. They don't have to go into stores and they can come and have groceries put in their trunk. The pop-up pantries have become popular, but these restaurants are hoping they can soon bring back the dine-in experience customers are craving. Joy Benedict, CBS News, Glendale, California. Coming up in our next hour, we'll have the latest on the coronavirus pandemic and we'll get you live updates on how other states are dealing with the pandemic. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS and CBS News. Suddenly, it seems everything around us has been turned upside down. What can people use in terms of their faith in order to get through these very difficult times? The main thing is you're not standing there alone. And our new normal is something we're all trying to figure out. 10,000 people with medical experience have stepped up to volunteer. So we're saying we're all in this together. It's incredible, Mola. Now, we need a place to turn to. Dr. Jerome Adams, how soon could we have a therapeutic in the hands of our caregivers? For answers. Should we be advising people to wear masks? Great question. Truth. Joining us now for an exclusive interview is the Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. Let's get to that urgent situation aboard the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And to make sense of our world. We're all trying to learn something during this crisis. We're all in this together. I mean, you gotta help each other out, no matter what. He's got it right. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell on CBS. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative. Da, 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 da. And truly original <laughs> reporting. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Rena Ninen coming to you from my home studio. At least 33 states are easing their restrictions today after federal guidelines to slow the spread of the coronavirus expired overnight. For some states, that means loosening social distancing measures and reopening certain businesses, such as restaurants, even movie theaters. But other states are opting to extend stay-at-home orders. And that includes Michigan, where hundreds of people protested at the state capitol against the move. Carter Evans is in Huntington Beach, California, where the governor made the decision to close beaches after large crowds last